Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming for part two for Reading Strategy Map. Uh, my name is Micheline Amar from L'Equipe Choc, and I'm very, very lucky to be surrounded today with my two uh, experts, my two partners experts, uh, Vanessa Boilly, uh, which is uh, our representative in language and social science from the PNE, and of course, our lovely Giovanna Salvaggio from Resi and uh, and, and of course, to our luck, we get to have Julie Boursier also from, uh, from Recipe PNE. So we are wonderful. I'm so lucky to be surrounded with this wonderful team. And thank you all for coming uh, for this really interesting uh, workshop. I'm gonna start off by, uh, well, of course, talk a little bit about uh, a specific uh, change that was done in the DED. And uh, we're gonna go into the reading of complex tasks and of course, adapting complex tasks to students particular needs. And of course, thank God for Rissi, who's gonna come and support us with all these digital goodies. So let's take a look. Uh, by the end of this workshop, hopefully we'll be able to recognize different type of texts using complex tasks and their characteristics. Uh, we'll be also able to use differentiation learning tools to support student challenges in math literacy. And of course, having reading strategy to apply in teaching co of complex tasks, which is really the heart and soul of this, this workshop today. So um, let me start by uh, talking to you a bit um, about the new DEDs. So, there is a bit of historic that I would like to introduce you to. So historically, when the program was written, the ideas behind it is that when students learn a math notion, it spiraled in their learning. What does that mean? It means when they learn an essential knowledge in one course, it gets reinvested in another and manipulated, and of course, get a value. But once an essential knowledge is evaluated, it shouldn't be. It wasn't expected for that specific knowledge to be reevaluated again elsewhere right? Because technically it becomes prior knowledge. So um, like, for example, um, if you have seen geometric transformation in secondary two, they're not supposed to be tested again in secondary five. But we also expected at the time to have a DET, um, the DED differentiate between the newly taught knowledge, the, the, the reinvested knowledge and the evaluated knowledge. They're supposed to be able to separate the in categories these knowledges, but it wasn't done. It wasn't, unfortunately, it hasn't, these changes were never made public. And that is, could be due to a, a philosophy change or a leadership change. So, you know, every time there's a new vision, there's a new change and everything gets put on the shelf and restarts or at least modified. So, um, <clears throat> So these knowledge stayed in the program. So what happened when they came back in time now recently, and they were looking at all of these, these the program, they noticed that there's a lot of stuff that was repeated. And one of the exams that you've seen uh, also um, in uh, the Bimmore writing in, um, in 5173, would see these geometric transformation and equivalent figure. So uh, because progressively when they, they revised uh, the, the program and they tried to align it with the youth, they noticed that these concepts should have been pro like logically, the progression of these concepts should be taught in 4273. So that's why these, these notions were removed and replaced, well, repositioned or reput in, in the 4273. So, but they still kept the geometric trans, uh, transformation in the 5163. And just to let you know, this is, of course, we're talking about the SN program, but for the CST, I don't know if any of you teach it, the 5051, the odd core, uh, the 5150, sorry, of secondary five CST is the odd one where you see some geometric transformation uh, combined, actually fused with optimization, right? So this is, this is where these changes occurred. Uh, and again, if you take a look again at the DEDs and the program, there's like minute changes. Some stuff were removed, some stuff were replaced, but just to follow kind of a progressive, a logical progression of learning, which is very much aligned with the youth sector. Um, another thing I would like to share with you is that how do you know that you have the new exams versus the old exam? I know this is, it could be an issue among some centers. There's a new format that the ministry had agreed on that for math exams especially, that um, all the new exam will have the same format, three complex stacks and four essential knowledge. So when you go and 
take a look at your exam. If you're administering at this moment exam with four complex tasks, this could be a sign for you to go and see your administrator or her sanctioned person to say, look, you need to update these exams. These are not the newest. So this is what concerned the new DEDs at this moment. Um, so when we're looking uh, for statements of problems, we're looking at a problem that consists of a set of information um, that it contains, that has a, um, that has a subject of, of a question or instruction, and also may require an inquiry or an action, uh, which implies to use mathematical notion tools. So these are the four characteristics that you take a look when you're building a complex tax or actually a problem that the students would like to uh, that have to solve. So now when we take a look at this, um, when we're, um, these are the four characteristics that you need to find, let's say different ways to solve them. So when we're looking at the presentation of information that can be in form of text table drawing diagram, here when we're looking at the competency that mainly uh, is administered, we're talking about changing registers. So if you're given a text, how can I transfer this information into a table or into a drawing or into a diagram? So there's that manipulation of information to, to understand uh, uh, is the student capable of transferring between register? Um, the second one is when we're looking at questioning of this sort is often explicit, but the problem solver can also take on such responsibility. This is, this is an interesting way of writing it because most of the questions is actually, they're explicit. What is something, however, the implicit part is what happened between the, 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 the text or what's the situation and what's the question's request is the, 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 the thinking process. So there's a lot of implicit in these explicit questions that put the students um, sometime at the, uh, in a very awkward position that they don't know what to do. So there's a lot of also um, a request of planning. There's a lot of linking concept. Okay, this, this is given to me here. This is what they're asking me. How am I gonna link them? And how can I use the math to link them? So there's, there's, there's planning and in these planning, when you kind of break these questions apart, there's subtask and it becomes very cumbersome. So, so how do I navigate in that implicit world? for the student and of course when 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 they're they're building their path when they're breaking down and they're they're kind of um planning uh their way to get to the solution sometimes they may find many ways to get the solution uh which one is the better way which one is the most efficient way so these are all things that they they deal with when they're actually developing an answer to to uh to to solve but my um in my opinion, the last one is the hardest one that I find, I found my students struggle with is the math, uh, mathematic uniqueness of a problem. You could make your student practice, practice, practice problem solving till they're blue in the face, but their difficulty is sometimes they know mechanically what to do. They read the problem and they get stuck. Okay, I know how to use hero's formula. I know how to use trig. I know how to use sign law. But how, why didn't I think that I need that in this problem? So like knowing when to use what in any new context. So linking the mathematical concept to, to, this, to the situation itself, right? To kind of clear up the situation to see only the math in it. So I, I find that was one of the, personally, that was my students most struggle. So we'll be looking at strategies for that too. So um, th uh, that being said, now, when we're looking at mathematical problem and its intentions, so of course, when we're looking at any problem, we have to, we have intentions behind every problem. So some of our intention would be to verify the learning of a new knowledge. So I just taught something new, did they get it? Or sometimes the intention of the problem that you want them to dab with is it's a new concept. So I'm, I'm introducing something new. I want them to, the intention is, I want them to struggle a little bit to figure things out on their own or provoking inquiry and decision-making. Okay, now I give them a problem and they'll have to actually make decision. Okay, do I use this or do I use that? What do I do, right? So, but part of these, what, these intentions of course come with questions in where and what, okay? So where does this problem come from? 
are they arithmetic questions? Are they algebra question? Are they geometry question? Are they probability question? And what's the intention with that, right? And what is the format of the question? So these are the main two principles that a question gets formed with. Is it given in a text form? Is it given in a table form? Is it given in a drawing form, a graphic, or even oral? Like for example, you may give a situation, a, a complex situation orally to a student where the student could has to decode and actually make sense of it, even if it's just orally. And, and remember, we're going to go back to something we did in the first workshop where we have to kind of, when we had to recognize, does the student have a poor comprehension or strong comprehension of the math itself? Or is he a poor decoder or a strong decoder of the language itself? So the oral, the oral component here, it becomes a really interesting, almost like a hidden diagnostic for the teacher to see, is it the math he's struggling with or she's struggling with, or is it really the language? So this is a way of also like, I could give the same situation by writing and the same situation orally and, and see where is it, does the student understand it better orally or better in written? Or maybe both, who knows? But it's, it's a nice way to kind of use the oral specifically to kind of not like distinguish where it does it fall is do I have to work more on his math or do I have to support them more with the language? So this is where we're, this is becomes really, really interesting. Now, when we're looking at the characteristic of a written problems, again, uh, notice most of the complex tasks that we get, right? It's either in an, in, an instructional text where um, you have a request for action or response to be formulated. So it's very, very um, uh, direct in term like, this is what I want. It's more instructional with a lot of information or it uses writing in term of informative, narrative, descriptive, right? Uh, so we take with me take a look at it. Is there a, is there a question? Is there a, a request? Is it is it implicit? Is it explicit? Uh, for example, if 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 I'm um, if I'm asking, for example, okay, what's uh, what's the price? Uh, how much is uh, seeds gonna cost me uh, on this land? Uh, you know, for this land. Well, really, all I'm giving. The, the idea behind it is I need to find the surface area for this. So this is an, a, a more implicit. So like connecting the question to something, you know, more, more, uh, um, more real, right? But there's a lot of work that has to be done that is not directly transferable. Like instead of saying, well, how many, if one carrot costs, I don't know, $1, how many two carrots will be, you know? That's a more of a direct versus an implicit. There, there's lots of step that's hidden and there's a lot of mental work that has to be done too. Uh, versus here, the information is provided through various means. Again, writing diagram, uh, tables. Am I missing information? Am I? Do I have everything I have? So that critical also, that critical thinking that you need. Is the problem complete before going ahead and, and solving it? Okay. Um, so now when we're taking a look at, again, when we're taking a look at um, the directive part of a statement, uh, is the instruction or uh, to execute. So the instruction again can be an order in term of step one, step two, step three, or it could be in term of a question. So if we if the task expect, expect the student, um, sorry, the task expected of student is explicit, at least in part the instruction, where, where you have like, you'll find those in the uh, essential um, knowledge portion, calculate the price, draw the graph, describe. So it's giving you, like notice that the verb even used, it's very direct. They, it, it, they want you to, um, to perform something, to, to, del to deliver something. Versus when it's a question, most of the time you'll find it's, a, it's always in a, most of the time is in an implicit form, right? So again, what is the price of two item? Can Paul buy his dream house? What errors are present in this graph? And this is where most of the time the students have difficulty because you may get lots of information in the text and it's never a pure form one of the, or, or another. You may get lots of information and then you have the question that kind of doesn't have a direct link. And then you're like, what's happening? They're asking about the house, but they're giving me dimension 
you know, or like, for example, you know, with this house, we will deliver on time and they're giving me uh, all the time that it takes to, to, to do, I don't know, to do the bricks and to do the layout and to do the, 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 fin the finishing of a house. So sometimes that, that implicit work that has to be done in the student's mind that, that needs to be kind of helped and, and supported. That's where most of our student uh, struggles too. Now we get to the fun part when we're talking about understanding a problem. So again, at this point here, when we're talking about understanding a problem, understanding, it's not something like you just push a button, oh, I understand. It's a continuum and it's actually developed over time, right? So um, you build. So how do we, we, we take a look for, for, for hint in understanding a problem through some of the text features in this case. So like, and, and you'll see Vanessa and, and Julie will probably uh, tackle this a little bit in depth a bit later, uh, but the vocabulary, right? So if they've seen unusual words, generic term, you know, these, these are all, these are all features that could hinder understanding for the students. When we're talking about syntax and lexical forms, again, uh, conditional, the, the, the sometimes the way the sentence is formatted, it could say, it could infer something different than what the students think it is, you know? So also a uh, complex grammatic, uh, grammatical structure, like information given in a question, knowing that. So there's like, this is the, the, this is a difficult area for students who have language issues, of course, and for our, the, the majority of our students, right? So, um, and what we want them to do once they understand the problem is, of course, the purpose of that is to build a mathematical model, right? And to be able to solve it. But these are all areas that we kind of um, not neglect or take for granted, but these are major area that we, we don't necessarily stop and think about because you know what, in math usually it's like, this is what you need to do. This is how you do it, do it, right? So now we're realizing more and more that there's a lot of words that we use that the students get stopped and, and struggle with that will hinder the understanding of the problem. And eventually that hinders in, in, uh, in turns the mathematical model that technically or most of the time they're able to do, but that's where they fall apart, right? So again, as uh, from the reader's knowledge, as, um, as to the nature of the information, so there's a lot of implicit knowledge that sometimes is not available to our readers. And for the type of text, of course, when we're talking about rule of writing uh, of a text, if you have a, if I have a student who comes uh, from another country who have different, um, let's say, uh, they, they, their language is not developed the way they should be, or, or even, even just simply have their weak readers and, and they're not comfortable with language, this is areas where they're gonna, they're gonna fall, fail. Or, or fall apart. Um, and also um, some, some of our students have difficulty having a global semantic representation. So they're, they're, they're difficult to make it, to put the story of the context together so they can see how they can build their, these mathematical models. So the, these are all areas we will be investigating in a bit too. So again, like the three type of text that we may have in our math uh, exams or in our complex tasks are these three over here, narrative readings, informative reading, and prescriptive reading, right? So when we're talking about narrative reading, we're talking about um, the kind of text that would have to set up a scenario in our head, like almost like having a whole movie going through our head. You know, the student imagine and represent the story and, and in his head, like draw uh, from his own experience, he fills in the blank from his own experience. So there's there's a scenario going on. There's a story going on in their head. Uh, in terms of informative reading, some of a complex task is more like that. So again, you do have a bit of a scenario, but the scenario is very small. And that means, you know, the understanding of the story is, is straightforward. And the information right now has to be kind of looked for and organized and structured. So now when we're talking about informative reading, so now you have information, now we have to clean up the information, reorganize structured information that makes sense. And in a prescriptive reading, you have the type of problem that must be, uh, that must be determined. So you, you, you're letting the students select the information and processing according to the instruction given. So again, remember, well, as you, you may all know also, all of the complex tests that we have, it's never one or the other. It's usually is a combination of some of these kind of texts and readings. 
uh, but there's one generally that stands out versus the others. Now, when we're today, that's that's why we decided to 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 look at it from three different um, perspectives. So, when we're looking from a cognitive skills involving a prob uh, problem solving, solving a problem, uh, we're looking at it from three perspectives. So, Vanessa. Yes. Well, on my side, the students have to read the statement and make sense of it. So they really have to get the meaning out of the words and have a correct global semantic representation of the problem. So they really have to understand the words and make a general understanding of it. Say, OK, so overall, this, what, this is what it means. And then they can go on to the next level. From my perspective, I'm going to actually give you tools, very, very specific tools in actual mathematic problems to show you how we could support the reading strategy in mathematics. So it'll be real, like I'll be modeling the read example with real intentions. So you could you could tool yourself up with. And Giovanna? You have to have adequate, uh, adequate mathematical concepts and tools and use these tools appropriately. So like they could have the tools, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they can align them in the right objective. And all this is at the same time. <laughs> Absolutely. And, 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 and of course, we will use whatever medium the student needs. So this is just a little fun thing I did with my title. So the title of this section is Reading and Complex Tasks. And then I just wanted to show you how an expert reader is going to see all of the differences of the meaning, but maybe the students are going to miss them. So if I write reading a complex task, it's not the same thing. I don't have two subjects. I'm reading something. So it's an action regarding something. And then if I just change the punctuation here, reading comma a complex task, I'm saying that reading is a complex task. And then three different sentences, like if you want to no statements with very small changes affect the meaning. So think of a whole text. The students have to actually get to the real meaning of the text. And sometimes just a comma is going to change the meaning. Sometimes a word is going to change a complete meaning. If they miss this, they might be off for the whole mathematical problem and actually are not able to resolve it at all or resolve it in a wrong way because the initial understanding of the problem is wrong. So I just wanted to show you here with a very small you know, piece of text that it might change everything. So expert readers are going to see this. A lot of our students are going to miss this. So yeah, so that was the small uh, impact here. So this is very interesting. This activity was given in one of our French centers by our lovely Julie Boursier, who's here today. So I'm thanking her. She might have to take the mic from me. Like I'm going to let her talk about this a bit later on, but she might have to take the mic from me a bit later on. And I'm sorry, because I have a sick daughter here, just uh, giving you a heads up. So she's very uh, amazing and telling me that I don't have to worry. She's there for me. So I thank her very much. But she actually gave me this. When I gave this workshop in French, uh, I was looking for an activity where reading was like a problem, but it was not in DBE. It was, I was really looking for something in CCB. I was like, what, you know, what have we given our students uh, in, ter in terms of readings and something that addressed maths and addressed reading. And then she was like, I have the perfect activity for you. I gave that to almost 300 students in a prep week. Because in the French centers, we have like a prep week for the students when they come in for the first time, the new students. And we give them a whole lot of strategies, tools to be able to navigate all of the, the courses, like be it French, maths, history, whatever. So this task was given to the students. And I'm going to let Michelin have you do it. And then Julie explain it to us how it went with almost 300 students. So you know what, uh, like like Vanessa, thank you Julie for 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 giving us this because when I read it, I was like, whoa! <laughs> for a moment, it took me a minute myself. So um, uh, I will give you a minute to read it if you don't mind and try to actually solve it just for fun, since you're all math teachers and you know what, it'll be fun. But what I want you to think about for for a moment when you're doing it, please put your students' hat on and try to see where would you be stuck. So note of those areas of difficulties in a literally two cent, like two, two line kind of a problem, right? So just put on this hat, 
take a couple of minutes, not as like the solving is, is to me is like secondary, but mainly to put that hat as a student and say, where would I stop? Where would I have difficulty? Where would my student have difficulty? Right? And we will discuss this in a, in a minute, okay? So uh, just to give you the floor, what do you guys think would be an issue with our students? Uh, Mr. Sanchez, go uh, ahead. No, just, just vocabulary because uh, Limos, uh, not even uh, people who speak English second language, they know that. Maybe yeah. they didn't watch Madagascar, the movie. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> kiwi is a fruit, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the main problem is, uh, I have seen some free tests or something like that. Uh, teacher, they love uh, a particular subject that uh, they included. For example, I had a teacher who is, in, he loved gathering a lot. And he included a lot on the free test. And some students had to ask me, what is that? And that's the main thing, you know, uh, teenagers or young adults, they have their own language, they have their own uh, wants. And I think we have to adapt to what they really, you know, the, the, the everyday vocabulary that you see. I, I agree with you, Limer and Kiwi. These are, or these are intentionally there for that purpose because you're right. Most of our students, kiwi to them means a fruit, but it has another meaning too. It's also a bird. But notice that they're in blue and they're linked to actually uh, to to uh, to a site where they have these descriptions, right? So uh, and let me also it's like it's not a bird, of course, but you're right. Also, the word aviary aviary is not a common term in in people um, you know, in an, an everyday language. You're absolutely right. Absolutely right. Um, any other observations? Um, Go ahead, Denise. It's Margaret. Margaret. Um, I was notice. I was noticing that you have Michelle has three birds, so you're counting three. But then a duck and two swans is repeated. And again, if you're not recognizing the full colon, petition or the um, expansion of the concept of three birds, you might count Michelle as having three plus a duck and two swans and six. That's right. But I knew a kiwi was a bird. The other thing that I might want to say is that Michelle um, is spelt differently in the question, that it, like in the, in the place for the answer than it is in the question. Because I was like, which who's that now? And I'm going back to the question to figure out who, who, who the other person is, right? So yeah. I don't know. That was what I saw. I love it. And that was with intention. And we'll tell you in a minute. And and Denise, do you have anything else to add? I know. Well, I would say it was it was the grammar with the three birds, the duck and so on. But also in the question itself, the names like Michelle and Michelin are very close and they are above each other, which again can be confusing, confusion causes confusion for people. Yeah. yeah. I, I, any other observation? These are amazing because it is written with these intentions, by the way. All of these, everything that was mentioned, which I so appreciated because it is designed with these intentions. And pairs of wings. Oh, yes. yes. So pairs, is that <laughs> one set of two or is that one each or is it, yeah, so that as well. Yeah, I just noticed that too, Denise, good work. <laughs> This is awesome because you really got everything within this problem that needs to be dealt with. And you're absolutely, absolutely right. I'll, I'll let Julie talk about the results, but me too, when like exactly for the same thing, when Vanessa brought me this problem and I looked at it, I'm like, well, yeah, that's like a, such an easy problem. It's two minutes. But then I, in a minute, I stopped and I thought, well, yeah, how many years I have under my belt, I, I how many, you know, even though I'm not like a, 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 English for me is like a third or a fourth language, but you know, I use it enough to, to say I'm okay, competent in it. And I had to stop for a minute on a few things. And I say, okay, let me reread this. And this is someone who's been doing this for a long time, right? So I could just imagine how the students walking to a classroom and getting a problem like that, well, of course, we designed it with an intention, but how many of these problems that we sometimes give in a book or uh, on a daily exercise without paying attention to that? You know what I mean? I'm not saying 
all of us, but some of us don't. <laughs> you know what I mean? And now it kind of got me a bit sensitive. Oh, that's like, oh my God, if I, I have to now pay attention to every word I write, because you're right, the uh, Mr. Uh, you know, Mr. Sanchez was saying, well, they have a different our, our our classrooms now, they're younger and younger, right? So they have a different language. We can't only stick to their language because we want to expand their palettes too. So but if we do, we need to kind of support them doing it. So I'll, I'll let Julie gives you the results. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I will just add that when I, I, I created um, that problem, it was all for that, you know, it was to let know the students that sometimes we find it very easy because lots of them were like, huh, you're giving us like five minutes. I just need one. It's so stupid as a problem. And I was like, eh, take your time. You can have the dictionary uh, on your um, with you. There's no problem with that. And it was like awful how people were so surprised of the result at the end. I will add also that um, at that time I was uh, giving them uh, the problem on a paper sheet. So the lemur and the kiwi were in, in blue. So most of the people that didn't want to take really the time to make the problem weren't, weren't uh, verifying in the dictionary. And so they thought that lemur was a bird and that a kiwi was only a fruit. And that part I've made it because I found it important to let them know that sometimes when you see a word that you say, oh, why that word is there? Because we are talking about birds. Why a kiwi is there? Why, why is it it's a part of it? You should verify. So I gave that problem to 296 students. Only nine had it all good. And on the nine that I did all good, two asked me about the Michelle with a me, <laughs> which I was like telling them also that everything that was there was good. There was no mistakes. Everything was verified. So two asked me about it and the nine have looked in the dictionary. So, and they, they took the time also. And I was telling the students that it was very important to take a step back and not be sure that it's easy because just to think about uh, for example, my daughter, when she started to swim, she wasn't able to stay under the water. She wasn't scared, but she wasn't staying there. And once I asked her, why are you so panicking and going up each time you're going under the water? And she started to cry because, and she told me like, well, mom, I'm not able to, to, to breathe under water like everyone else. She was very pursued that she had to breathe under uh, the water. So most of her students are sometimes like that, you know, they, 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 they don't, they think differently the, the information they, they, they have. So we have to think about it too. Yeah. And, and, and just to add to what Judy, and I love, I love your first question is like how Michelle and Michelle is different, like she said, was with intention. So most of the time, even like, let's take a moment and say, what, what would be your answer? Just out of curiosity, put it in the chat, please. Like just out of curiosity, what would be your answer for, for the second one? How many birds does Michelle with an E owns? Giving answer three. But yeah. how would you answer Michelle, given the context? I would assume it was a typo. <laughs> so that's like, yeah. and I would have put three. Yeah. And I did the same thing. Yeah. I went through the slides and I actually had this, this was a conversation with Michelin when where I was like editing. I corrected that mm -hmm. and I was going through it. She's like, no, 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 that's deliberate. So, and yeah. I like that you, you, you tell so because what I was telling also to my student was, if you have a doubt, write it in the exam. 
and do the both answer you can think about. Because like that, maybe you won't have all the points, but the teacher will be, will have a glimpse into your head how you you uh, you you reflect on it on the problem. But there's um, I'm sorry, I don't know who it is. It's uh, Lanval. Uh, I don't know your name. She just put something interesting in the chat. Michelle. Michelle. Hi, Michelle, I'm so sorry. That's no, okay, um, no problem. But it, you put a very interesting remark because it's does does the student assume that the teacher made a mistake? Because for the student, it's like but it must be like a typo, but you know, like how do they process that? So a very interesting question. Also, I want to add that I think Margaret said then it's not three, it's zero. And that was my answer the first time I did it around in French. And actually the math teacher told me, is it really zero? Because you don't know. And I was like, oh my God, you're taking this to another level, you know, because I was going to put zero in like the correct answer. And he said, you should write, I don't know. And I was like, oh, okay. That's a, even like taking it further, you know, because maybe Michelle that I don't know who it is might own birds somewhere else. <laughs> I was like, okay, maybe that's too much for me, but I just want to push it like to the extreme, you know, we could go and say, maybe the answer is not zero. Maybe it's, I don't know. It's not written. And, and personally, I find, I find sometimes it's nice, it's nice to kind of shock your students and challenge them and, and have these conversations and say, this is how I would look into your head. So share with me, don't take anything for granted, even a simple question like that, you know, it's an addition question. Yeah, it's easy, but it became so complex in a fraction of a second, right? When you break it apart. And this is the idea. Sometimes these students need to be shocked that it's not easy, even if it's a question could be two sentences or half a page long, they have to be all taken with an eye, with a care, with a, 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 like, you know, with a with a, a detective eye, like, okay, you're absolutely, why is Kiwi there? Why Lemur is care? Okay, so they wanna trick us, fine, but let me check, make sure I understand. So language here plays a big, big role. And this is where our students take it for granted. They're just like, oh, I don't understand it or whatever, you know? But no, we have to teach them tricks from day one to, to say, no, take the time to do this. And I understand it's difficult, but it's, yeah, but it's a tricky problem. You're absolutely right, Vanessa. So this over here, this is, um, I just wanted to share with you. I know Vanessa also uh, would, would share these, uh, these, uh, these feelings with me. Um, on the French side, they had used a translation of actually this book, which is actually a very, very good translation. What they did is they combined three books in one, the, the, the reading strategy in, in math, science, and social science. So this is more like a collection, a collective work for these three uh, uh, disciplines, but it's actually the writers are originally in English. So I bought this book when I, I bought this book, I actually bought the whole collection just to let you know I have it for writing math, uh, uh, writing strategy for math, I have it for uh, reading strategy in science, I had it for all anything that they did because they had real uh, tools, real applied tools, and a variety of tools, and actually they have the research behind it. So this was a very, very good book that I recommend, and it, that's what inspired me to actually to work with Vanessa in in, in presenting this this um, presentation to you, which was already got presented in the on the French side. So uh, Martin and and Vanessa. Um, Thank you for, for sharing it with us on the English side. So, uh, and you'll find uh, in, in this book, it tackles tools with enriching vocabulary, activating prior knowledge, uh, reinvesting prior knowledge, prediction and inferences. They show you tools to use. I love number five, thinking aloud. So like actually asking the students, okay, guide me in your thinking, but actually say it. And sometimes when they write, they don't think, they just write mechanically things. But when they start, they have to say something out loud. Like, okay, step one, you have to do this. They're actually really thinking through it. And you'll see like whatever they're planning to say, they're actually, oh, well, this shouldn't, that doesn't make sense. And they stop. And this is exactly what this this technique number five is actually a really, really good technique to make the students think through their solution and also to help them kind of break down on, on how they solve something in like leaving traces on their, on their, on their sheets, right? When they tell, oh, I just know how to do it. Okay, so guide me through it. So everything he says or she says, you can take it down and say, well, this is what I want to see. This is what I want to look for. So you're like, it's almost like a tool to help them like kind of slow down their thinking 
to and evaluate it while they're doing it. Um, the questioning for sure. Uh, number seven is also one of my favorite is summarizing. Like when you say, okay, you read a complex task, you read a problem, and okay, tell me that in your own word. What did you understand? What's the story is about? Tell me the story. Never mind the math. Just let's talk about the story. What did you understand? To make sure they actually really understood the situation, right? And what's the question to identify these parts. So these become a really, really good tool when you ask someone to retell you the story in their own words. It become they, become they they take ownership of the situation, which is super interesting. Of course, when we're talking about visual representation and mental imagery, we're talking about changing registers at this point. So we're kind of working, helping the students, supporting the students in that specific, let's say, competency. Uh, I know some of our students have difficulty imagining spatial thinking and stuff. So this is maybe an opportunity to kind of support that. Or give them tricks when you're stuck, uh, like uh, 3D, uh, when we're looking at Sec3 and you have to see things in 3D or not see things, but draw things in 3D. And some of our students have really difficult time seeing that. This will become super interesting method or a tool to help that out. Of course, using, uh, using text structure, like you just saw, the semicolon is like a numbering thing. So the three birds is already like the, the, the two duck and the swan. It's already included in the three, three birds. But if you're absolutely right, if it's somebody who's not very, doesn't know, he's going to double. The, <laughs> and that's correct. Well, that's not correct. That's correct for you to see so you can help them out. But in the same time, it's the same time. It's, er, it's nice to have it early on, to catch it early on. Uh, then later, so it could be addressed. And if you address it once, it goes across the board in math and English and French and all kind of across board disciplines, right? So I'll show you here a little examples of what you could find in the book. So you have, of course, a concept of the finish, uh, definition map where you have a, a concept in the middle and you have what it is, uh, what does it look like, an example, three ways of representing it. So this could be a tool. Another tool where you have, it's a vocabulary, you have a word in the middle and then you look at it in different ways. Um, you have, again, for the uh, per, uh, picture prediction you could you could have a picture and you say okay what's the next in case if you if you're if you're looking for a sequence for example or a pattern or even from another thing you could give a picture and I'll tell tell your student okay now create a problem based on this image or or on this table or whatever so you could get them to kind of work you know it it, it, it their creativity and their thinking right and of course, this is one of my favorites. And also, I think Vanessa's also, if I'm not mistaken, for the think sheet. So students, again, may have questions, right? So let's take a look at the first one. For example, isn't everything positive with an absolute value? So now my thoughts. So this is my question. And now what do I think? I think it depends where the negative are in the problem. So this is what I think. Now, let me look at the problem or on whatever the teacher taught me to see, to find proof to support what I think. So sometimes, you know, these are good questions that the student may ask and, or like a problem we identify with them, but you may ask them, okay, like let's, let's build like almost like a question answer, self question, self question and self answer kind of a, a tool where you're gonna prove to yourself, you're gonna, in your own words, okay, you found it in there. Okay, so let's write it here. So whenever you have this kind of question, you could go back to your answers and see where you, you kind of supported it. I thought it was like a wonderful, wonderful tool to use. And now, uh, I think this is uh, Vanessa. Yeah. Well, these were uh, slides that we didn't get the chance to look at the last time. And I think they're very important. That's why I decided to actually put them in. These are different behaviors or strategies that effective readers do use. So we're going to look at a few examples of them. Active reading, so to be active, not be passive while reading, be very like uh, the task, the, the every task is one of these where we want to actually make the students be more active and like very like into the reading. Uh, set reading goals before reading and the ivory the two, two main were build and question the meaning of the message. So someone wrote very wisely in the chat, would they question what the teacher wrote? And actually we want them to question the meaning of the text or, you know, is it 
correct that there's a knee at Michelle or not, and then they can go up to the teacher and ask the question. So there's, they should be able to do that. And then determine the meaning of unknown words and concepts. So we have kiwi, lemurs, maybe aviary, so different words. And they were told at the beginning, you are allowed to use the tools in the classroom. They have dictionaries on their, you know, uh, everywhere in the classroom. So they were actually encouraged indirectly to use them, but we wanted to check, are they gonna use them? You know, is it a strategy they're using? And this is the first observation we had on these students, you know, do they use these strategies or do we have to teach them to use the different tools in the classroom and be able to go up to the teacher and ask a question? So I, I think it was very clever of Judy to do that in the prep, uh, prep week, but there's many other, you know, strategies like making inferences, um, considering the, their prior knowledge, considering what they know about the author. So these are all, actions that we would like to see in very efficient readers. So I'm not going to go through all of them, but just to let you know that these are there and you can take a look later on to, to each of the specific ones. One that is very important, um, another, yeah, you can move slide, Michelin, thank you. One thing that we looked at last time, this we presented last time just before Giovanna's part, was that we have four profiles of readers and Michelin addressed this earlier saying, what do we do when they have good comprehension but they're poor at reading, the one in yellow, and then we use oral because we wanna make sure that if they're good at comprehension, if I give the same problem, not written, but orally, they should be able to do it because they have the knowledge and maths, the competencies to actually solve the problems if they don't have to read the problem. Reading is the only problem in the yellow um, profile. Good decoding, good comprehension in orange, we don't have any problem. Those are our strong students. They're good at reading. They're good in literacy and math literacy and language literacy, so we don't have any problems there. They might be good at decoding, but poor at comprehension. So then they can read the problem, but they're not going to really understand the problem. This is the, I'm going to be honest, this is a hard one to detect, but we're able to detect. We're going to look at a small video afterwards. And poor at decoding and poor at comprehension, they have a lot of issues, but we then can start with fluidity. And there's a second a video that we're not gonna look at today, but you're gonna see later on um, there, it's, it's on the slide. So you're gonna be able to go watch it. What's very nice is we told last time we shared, I think the French videos, but they were made in English. I'm sorry, I was on maternity leave when they translated my work and I, I missed it. So, you know, it happens, mommy brain. So they do exist in English. We almost made that again for nothing, but they do exist. So we're gonna show you the first one and you're gonna, you're gonna have time on another moment to actually look at the second one if you want to. Go ahead. A question, just for when we go back to, I'm, I'm still, I'm delayed in my thinking because I'm, I'm trying to process. So that, that math problem that you showed us, you said you gave it to 296 students. Who, I didn't understand who were they? Like in your French system, who, who were they that you gave it to? Uh, we, uh, it was the students that were uh, coming for their first time to the school, to the center. What, what age? Uh, it's what, what age oh my God, uh, between 17 maybe and 45, depending okay. of, but they, it, they are younger and younger. So probably okay. more that 25 would be the, the average. Okay. Yeah. Cause I'm, I was just thinking like, cause we're, we're struggling at our adult center of our math skills, we're seeing that, especially with the debouillage that's come in, we're having to, to bring them back. But I was thinking like each semester we run a math course, that would be a great thing to do for the very first math class. Yeah. Like I've never thought of having dictionaries in a math class before and things. So I'm thinking this is, I'm going to copy this and give it to the math teachers and say, this is something maybe just as a how to start your semester with the brains thinking and so I was, couldn't figure out how you used it. <laughs> I, I won't take time on it because we can talk about it like 45 hours but they the, the CST courses are a great a great way of having that time with the student and giving them credits for it. So we are developing right now things about like a, a digital pet uh, sequences where the student will have the possibility to get credits 
to reflect in a portfolio about a course, any course. So that could be a way of doing it, you know, of ha having that time to see how uh, the student, um, how the student think, how and and to let him know how what is um, is mode d'emploi in English is how you yeah exactly <laughs> you know so yeah because it's very um efficient because most of them were coming back to me uh in the year and tells me that uh, after doing that little problem they were more aware in their mathematical classes because they 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 they, they had that consciousness of everything you know very little elements that you have to put together and i usually talk about um, putting a detective at you know any problem anything you're reading you're a detective you have to go and look and try to make the links between so if it's something that is interesting you and if michelin don't mind i, I can uh, take your um, your uh, email uh, address and write back to you about it because uh, it's something that uh, I think it, it's valuable with what we're doing with students. That'd be great, thanks. Yeah. And, and, and just to add a bit, I think, I think we don't use enough dictionaries in our math and science courses. Even though there's a new info sanction that says they're allowed to use dictionaries in the exams, by the way. So that so might be. I didn't know that one. Last time when we gave the French one, they were not authorized. And that's something that was like thrown at us a lot. You know, they said, well, we're not authorized to use dictionary in the evaluation. So they are now. They are, yes, because, uh, well, that's another conversation for another time. But yes, we should check. Uh, well, I'll, I'll send you the info sanction. So just to make sure, this might be something uh, that might be something that you could bring into your administrators and, and, and make sure like that they see it or, you know, so they could allow the students to, yeah. But there's other things that has to be set up in the classroom when we get to that, but that's another conversation, but definitely that's something that we should bring in more and more into our math and science classes for sure. So let me show you, like I'll share with you the, little, the video that uh, Vanessa had made. The North American Nick looks like many other students. Here we see him in his natural habitat. He is ready to start his day in an adult education center. What luck we have to see him opening a pre-secondary reading workbook. Let us listen to him read from his manual. In 1930, there was 113 models. Now, let's have a look at his reaction. If this North American Nick is not given support, this incident could have long-term consequences. For more than half of the population, reading is a complex undertaking. For 10 to 15 percent, it is the most difficult cognitive task that they must perform. Reading is a learned skill of paramount importance. One is not simply born with it like the ability to speak. It is an extremely complex task that requires practice to achieve a certain level of ease. Proficient readers are not necessarily aware of what is at play when facing a written page. It can be a highly taxing exercise. The adult education paradox is that reading is essential to work in the activity books used in most adult education programs, although statistics concerning our students show that the vast majority lack proficiency. Studies show that 75% of high school failures are due to reading difficulties. In this reading fluidity video, pedagogical consultants will find tools to help teachers in whose classes lurk members of the North American Nick species. Reading fluidity is comprehension through speed and accuracy. 
It also means the ability to instantly identify words correctly, implying expressive reading that resembles oral language. The best teacher in the world, using the most current and effective reading strategies, cannot guarantee that students will have an optimal understanding of a written text if they do not have fluidity. If reading is not fluid, all of the student's effort goes into decoding, which leaves very little room for understanding. Memory function is overworked and saturated. Comprehension becomes nearly impossible since all the reader's energy is focused on deciphering the words instead of understanding the meaning. Working on reading fluidity is essential for certain students. That is easier said than done, but not because the exercises are complicated or that the research is not clear. Research shows us that the process is quite simple. Students need a reading model, practice, feedback, and explicit instruction. Teaching reading fluidity is hard because we are bringing to light the bane of their existence. For them, reading has always been a losing battle. Students will not be jumping for joy when they hear that they will have to read aloud. Teachers will certainly feel the brunt of their frustration, too. So what can a pedagogical consultant do to help work with teachers and students, fostering teamwork to help overcome the obstacles that will most certainly appear along the path to success? Work with principals and administrators to make sure that the necessary support is available to the teachers committed to this type of pedagogical endeavor. There are four essential elements that help to make the fluidity project at our school board successful. One, all stakeholders must believe in the benefits of reading fluidity. We must constantly remind ourselves why we are teaching reading. Otherwise, it is much too easy to give up. Working on reading skills requires a lot of time and effort in the short term for results that are long term. Two. Planning is essential for choosing the appropriate time to meet with teachers and for knowing where they stand. Assessment tools designed with the student in mind play an important role in measuring progress. There must be time set aside for experimenting with new tools that will be created and even modeled for teachers. There can be immediate feedback to help us make the right adjustments. 3. Look at the project like an experiment. We can then give ourselves license to be wrong. In this way, we relieve some of the pressure of finding the perfect solution, since we are simply testing what has been proven in the literature. There's no need to panic. No one will be injured if we make a mistake. The opposite could not be truer. If we do nothing, our at-risk students are the ones who will pay the price. We must follow up on our checks and balances. We must listen to frustrated teachers and act on those frustrations. We must look for solutions with them. We must help them to reflect on their practice. And four, we celebrate our successes and victories. Highlighting the work that was done and the progress that was achieved are good ways to keep everyone motivated to pursue our ultimate goal of reading fluidity. At the end of the day, fluidity is what makes proficient readers. Um, so as you've seen, um, you know, in, in every school, in every school, we have these issues and reading is really, really, um, how can I say, really difficult. And uh, we have to consciously make an effort, even I, I, I'm not doubting the effort It's just make a moment like part of a routine, like that five minute, and it doesn't have to be allowed in a classroom setting, it could be now, thank goodness for technology, they could also film themselves, if I'm not mistaken. What yes. would you think? Yeah, you're right. And I mean, that's the Fleury video. That was a, a whole experiment that we did in our centers that we called uh, Pavillon, because this is where we had, we had all of our students with most difficulties, like mainly CCBs coming from uh, insertion socioprofessionnel, semi-professional background, stuff like that. So we had the, really the, the students who were the weak, weakest, I hate to use that word, but at reading. And they made a whole program throughout the school where math teachers and French teachers and all the teachers worked together and had the students read many, many times with models uh, each week. And you can see they were reading out loud, they were reading in pairs, they had models, teachers were reading to them out loud. So they, they really insisted on reading. And actually like, it's not 
really uh, explained in the video, but they had very great results. And you could compare because this center was unfortunately closed right now, but it existed for many years and they could compare the results. And they, they said they really saw an increase in, well, just having courses, you know, be a success because they normally they would be stuck for many, many hours in CCB courses. And then they really see, they saw there was like an improvement, like lower hours and more success rates in the school. So they really see the difference. So they were like, it was a, a big involvement from all of the teachers, but the results were really showing. So it's interesting. I'm not saying everybody has to do this, but I'm just saying when we really concentrate on this you know, problem of reading and we actually give tools to the students, might be technological tools, Giovanna's gonna talk to this later on, but when you give them tools, we can really see improvements in all of the discipline subjects. So it might be in mathematics. You know? So we have the, because we know with the new program, they have to read a lot. So if they're weak readers in all of the courses, they're at disadvantage. So really when we address this, we're gonna have an improvement everywhere. And that's, you know, that, that do motivate students when they, they start to see results. And at the beginning, it wasn't easy to be honest. Like <laughs> students were very like resistant to this because they have experienced so many, you know, I would say failures with reading or feeling you know, judge reading in front of a classroom, all these bad experiences were coming back to them. So it was like a kind of a healing time before they were getting involved, but that was a, a very good project that had uh, many, uh, many, many, many results. On a lower scale, like I was gonna say, like I'm not saying everybody should do this, like this is a huge project, but teachers can do actions in the classroom to actually address this. And these are five actions that any teachers, be it a math teacher, a French teacher, an English teacher, a history teacher can do in their classroom to improve the reading skills of their students. And one thing is the, to take the, the time to understand each strategy in their own reading, actually analyze how you are as a reader and whenever you can make this explicit, tell the students what's going on in your head, the question you're asking yourself, the steps you're taking to understand the text in maths, in history, whatever you're teaching, it doesn't matter. The, the, what they need is reading models. Even if you're not a super strong reader, that's super like interesting. Micheline and Giovanna were telling me last time, like, this is not my first language. You know, I have many other languages that I, and, a lot of our students are like that. So what are the strategies, the tools are using to actually read and understand the text is super relevant, even if you're not an expert reader. So incorporate explicit instruction in reading strategies into daily or recurring activities. So whenever you can do it, make it like part of your daily routine, or daily teaching strategies. Uh, learners apply each strategy to a wide variety of texts in different contexts. So that's why when it's throughout the school, when it's all of the teachers pitching in, they're not just the language teachers, it makes a huge difference. So this is something that can be done without adding a huge project. It's just like taking five minutes a day, all of us to take the time to actually do this. Group learners differently to teach strategies. So instead of like grouping learners, and based on mathematic skills or whatever, you can base you can pair them on a weak and a strong reader and actually have a task assigned for the strong reader to read out loud to the weakest reader in maths, in history, whatever. But think your teams once in a while based on reading skills. And then gradually teach learners the responsibility of applying a comprehension strategies. So if you teach them a strategy, go back to it, ask them, have you used this that we taught the last time? I had a, um, yeah, you're, you're right. Uh, Julie's gonna suggest later on a tool that she has a right reading tool that it's very relevant. Uh, and I was gonna say, I went into a math teacher classroom just before the pandemic and he was using a lot of strategies. And one of them was actually to have them read the problem like backwards. So they were reading backwards and just underlying the important information and then reading it the right way. So they he hadn't read them twice, but in different ways, because you know, oftentimes students are, oh, it's gonna be boring. Read it twice, oh, I don't feel like it. And he was like, no, we always start with the question. What's the question? And very often it was in bold, you know, in bold. So there was like hints of like, what's the question? So we go to the question and then we move remotely. What am I lacking? And we go up, we go up, we go up. And these solving methods really worked. And the students, each time they were going to his you know, desk with a complex, I said, I don't know what to do. Did you do it 
backwards. And I was like, oh, that's funny. I find it funny. I was like, it's surprising. And it was working. The students were like doing this. And then I came back to the class and they were doing it this. And it was like, you know, I did it backwards, but I'm still lacking this. And I'm like, oh, that's great. That's very a great way of doing this. Sorry, my daughter is starting to act up. But um, yes. So another thing that we noticed when I was working with Martin in French, and I found this so relevant for you guys to work in the classroom with the students is that the text structure or the text types are often linked to different mathematical knowledges. So you're gonna, we're gonna explore this together, but you're gonna see these are stuff that you can underline and explain to students and have them make these hypothesis. hypothesis. Of course, that the text structure will um, will play with how the student will understand or not what he has to do. So, for example, text format, if it's a, a, an external structure of the text, like title, page, credits, table of contents, uh, images, the titles of titles, um, it won't be exactly the same if it's internal structure of the text. The type of the text, the main and secondary ideas, Everything has to be a part of the comprehension of the student. Um, and to be able to use the text structure, sometimes it could be a good idea to go outside of the text. For example, um, when I used to be a French teacher, what I would do is to present a movie to the students and then uh, at almost like maybe 40 minutes of, well, I, I'd chosen some part of the movie, I would, I would um, uh, finish the, the, well, I would put it on pause and then ask them questions. And it was pretty, pretty great, the answer I would get. And uh, the analysis was very interesting. And then at the end of all that, I would tell them, and it was usually the, the students that were the, the weaker, that were the better to give me those answers. And at the end, I would tell them, you know, everything we did now with pictures, with the movie, with all the scenes, you can do it when you read something. Because it's not true that it's always the, the word itself that is important, the way it play, it is placed on the page, the way it is linked to other, you know, a, a formula in itself in math, it's sometimes difficult to, uh, to, 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 to resolve, but, you know, it's there also, like you were saying, Micheline, before, um, we, we, uh, we, we ask students to learn things in mathematics that are pretty like, very like formulas and everything, but then they have to make a link on it, depending on how it presents. If it's a table of content that they have to fill up, it won't be the same if it's uh, uh, something they have to give an answer like a text. I'm not sure that that was the way you were thinking about that slide, Vanessa, but I tried my best. <laughs> it was very good, Julie. Yeah, it's true. And actually, that's good because you give them a teaching strategies. I was not doing it that way, but I love the way you, you did it. And where I was going with this is that you see at the top, it says students can more easily decode the meaning of the text when they have um, knowledge of the structure and characteristic of the text. So, of course, these knowledges are used in the languages courses, but we might use them in maths once they have them from the languages courses. So that's what we're going to do right now. So I'm going to test a bit of your knowledge. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> we'll do it together. Um, so if you put the task, Micheline, like the next slide. So I'm going to give you a few minutes, like maybe two minutes to read this, unless someone wants to read aloud. I'm not going to read aloud, but if someone wants to read aloud, that person is welcome to do it for the others. So I'm going to ask you a few questions about this. What are the hints you have to actually let you know which type of text this is? What are the hints you can look at? That's a hard one, eh? That's more of a language question than a math We question. want the language people to answer. <laughs> Um, Good, Giovanna. Well, we start with the subject, right? We start with like, it's like it's starting with the story. It's Leonie and Abdul. La, la, la. We have context, like it's it's a story. There describes yeah. them. You have like this. It's setting the stage. It's setting the scene. 
I was just going to say the same thing, Giovanni. It's a narrative. Mm -hmm. You're correct, Margaret. That's a narrative text, but we're using it in maths. And that's something that's very important because so Julie was saying that earlier, and it was actually a very good comment. A lot of our students are not able to imagine, like play the scenario in their head. You know, they can't do that. So when in maths they're presented with a narrative text, sometimes they are actually like they block. They're like, what do I do now? It's a story. Where's the information? Like it's not a table. I have an image and I have a story. What do I do with it? How do I actually change it to like find the story in my head and then find the like the important mathematical information and these are especially in dbe there's a lot of them in the exams in the workbooks so this is taken from a, a workbook in french um and we're like okay this is something like we have to address and then i'm not going to ask you to solve it as a math teacher it's more to see that that's important. Like the fact that we're using a narrative text might be an obstacle, might be a problem for some students. And then we have to go with them and have them make the scenario. Like what's happening? Give me the steps. What are the, the parts of the story? So you have the different characters, something's happening in their life and they have a decision to take. So you actually have to break it down for them if they're not able to do that themselves because very often like you would have someone who would um, like actually use this type of pen and just say okay this is like a you're not seeing it but it's like I'm going to just like underline all the information the, the math informations but some of them might not be relevant so you have to make sure that you understand the story and then that you pick out the relevant mathematical informations so that's uh, if, one. if I may yeah. Uh, a, a, a tip I was giving to my to my students, it was to imagine themselves talking about what they have read to someone else. And that someone else had to say at the end, oh, yeah, I understand what you have to do. But if that other person was like more in, uh, with that, yeah, there was something that they weren't understanding in the problem. So that could be a a good way to make them because they, they, they are scared of reading. They are really scared. And they also scared of writing something. I don't know, at one point, they, they think that how they, they, they talk is not the same as how they should write. And for myself, I would say that to them like, hey, I don't mind. I, I want to know what's in your head. I don't know, I don't know, I don't want to know if you're able to write it in the good way. First of all, you write it like it sounds, and after you'll do the correction. I just want to add one thing though, like for a second or third language learner, look at how much text there is yeah. before they actually get to the information that they need to solve. So yes, they're scared of reading, but the processing that it takes is also like, it's heavy. Yeah. And that's very important, Giovanna. And one of the things that Martin and I wanted to do with this in French and we lack time and skills, maybe we would have needed like Giovanna or Julie to help us out, but we wanted to make like comic books. Like what if I take this and I make it like different, like a uh, comic, you know, like with the characters and you see the image and they're talking to each other and they, they're, you have three characters. Denise, yeah, you have a comment about that? Well, I, I was just gonna say, it's that breakdown, like having worked mm -hmm. in, in junior high and then at adult ed, they look at that and they go too much information and then they don't even try to read it. It's just overwhelming. So broken down in the comic book where it actually you can pick up your information better, it, that would work. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm glad you, you think so. I think it was a very like brilliant idea. We just lacked time, but that's what we wanted to do at first with this. I wanted to take it and then say, what if I presented it this way now in a comic book? Do you think the students would like it better? And yes, of course we think so. And I'm, I'm glad you're, you're, you're agreeing. Um, Micheline, you want to add something? I, I don't want to cut you. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, I just wanted to add, like I, when you were mentioning the highlighter, this is a trick that the students have seen over and over everywhere. But I know in my class, when I've seen some of their work, when they highlight, they almost highlight the whole page. So I don't know what is important anymore. So you know what? When... I see like if they don't even know how to use that tool specifically. So when it ends up being highlighting and you re-highlight everything that you read, it's not highlighting anymore, right? So so this yeah. is this is this is important to 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 recognize too that uh, whenever a tool get taught, actually to get taught 
properly and maybe sometimes to show it, how can I say, to, to, to show it to the student, but actually get the student to show you back what they, how to use the tool, because sometimes we show a tool and we think they know how to use it, but then they come back and it's misused. So it becomes an, an obstacle, an added obstacle. So we have to be careful with that too. Any tool that we use, that to make sure that it's actually used properly and they show you how to, like th there is that back, you know, to come back with the teacher and to verify how it's used because a tool becomes an obstacle if it's not useful, right? I just I'm wanted to agree with you. I've seen these text, you, even I, in French. Oh, go ahead, Joanna. I do want to interrupt you. It's just, uh, Denise made a very, very good point that I wanted to, sometimes it's perceived as lazy. The student doesn't know what to do. And they're like, I cannot process all of the things that I need to do. And I just freeze and they cannot. And so it's very, very like, thank you for sharing that because it's very common. We're like, ah, oh, but they're not motivated. Like what I'm trying everything, but it's because they cannot compartmentalize the steps that they need to take because it's too much at one time. So thank you for bringing that up. It's a very good point. Thanks, Ravana. Yeah, you're right. Michelle? Uh, yes, I just want to say, first of all, I really love what you're saying, but uh, my head is going, oh boy, oh my God, where do I find the time? So then I start thinking, okay, okay, uh, you get your teachers in, I teach math and English, but our pedagogical counselors want to put the students in at the math secondary one level because they haven't completed that, even though they're at secondary three and four English. But what my brain is saying maybe now is maybe we should be focusing on making sure they're in English registered so I can get a grip on what their English skills are. And then after that, but then we don't get funding when they're in two different groups, the diversified and vows come in. So it becomes a whole issue of like, you know, bringing them up to the same level so they can get into pro pro, uh, professional development courses. So I just feel that uh, your strategies are really good. English for sure is a basis to being able to decode all this. And I thank you for that. But wow, our system is really uh, a challenging system, isn't it? Thank you. Yeah, but you're, it's a very relevant comment, Michelle, about the, the, organiz, uh, the organization, how you know it works with the ministry and everything. I think Julie saying earlier that maybe if you do the CST courses, it might help. Yes, Those are yes. step five courses, and you could use them even if the student is in CCBE. So maybe that's where you can work on strategies. You don't have to be in language or maths. Maybe you have to keep them lower and use different like optional courses, like the CST one, to actually use the reading strategies. Like for the few first courses you would be able to really like focus on that so maybe that's one way to uh, solve this problems but you're right it's it's like financing plays a role in what's happening in the classroom that's true uh, mr sanchez you wanted to ask yes uh, yes i want to say something about these problems uh something i don't really like is a lot of you know uh useless information there and in real life People don't work like this. I work almost 20 years on the private sector and report and instructions, they are so direct. So I don't understand why we put the students on this kind of situation. I understand they really need to, to tell what is important, what is not important. But in real life, I, you know, report, instruction, they go so direct. They, they, they don't put, uh, they don't include uh, this kind of useless information. For example, in this problem, they should say something like Lionel and Abdul, they want to buy a TV and the information. And they will help more to the students because, it, you know, uh, the math is, is important, okay? The reading is, is fundamental mm -hmm. for the success of the student, but, you know, uh, the math has to be attached to the concepts on, 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 on the problem. For example, uh, we had a little situation on the center I'm working. They, they were saying, oh, uh, the student, they don't know how to, to read. So they asked some English teacher and resources to start teaching them how to read the math problems. There's no need to say that was a total disaster. It didn't work. And they put teachers on, on, uh, on a lot of stress because many English teachers, they don't really like math. Mm. And that was a big problem that happened. Uh, other thing is expecting a teacher helping students to read, a math teacher, 
you know, it's better to give it to a professional, an English teacher, and as a math teacher, I have to be aware of the English level that they have. So I will apply it for the, the, the exams or problems. Same thing with science and math. Uh, as a science teacher, you have to be aware of the math they are, they are working. So I will be able, because if I start just teaching them, you know, there's a lot of time I'm gonna be using instead of just helping with the math. Uh, that's my, it, it, it's, it's a really novel idea to have a cross curriculum thing, but you know, every teacher has specialization, their professional professionals. So I, I think we more we have to be work together, not like just doing everything at the same time. Because that's my my, my 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 thinking. But you know, they are really pushing to the math teacher doing the English or the French and the English teacher doing the math and the science and multitasking sometimes doesn't really work that well. That's my 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 opinion. Oh, I understand, Mr. Sanchez. And I was going to say, like, this problem, you might have, like, four or five versions in your classroom. You were talking about the skills of the students. Maybe you have, like, you're thinking about their English skills. Maybe you have this version for very advanced students, and then you have one in comics books for different students, and then you have one with, like, you, you really, like, shorten the sentences and just pull out the very important information for other students. So you might yes. have the same. I mean, I, don't, I know it's a lot of work, but knowing oh, their skills, you could address this differently. You know, it's a good idea. It's the same problem for a student with the lower level of the language, yeah. with lower, and the same problem with a more complex is structure of the language. Yeah, it's, it's a very good idea. idea. It's a lot of work, but it's good. Uh, you know, I, I'm willing to do it, but to, yeah, <laughs> just... not too many people want to. Yeah, but you'll see, Mr. Sanchez, when we're going to get a bit later on, we're going to show you like a more complicated math problems and how you could start off with just simple, like just uh, like a triangle with like a table and then work backward, like add a few words and then give them initially the situation. We're going to we're going to see this is a technique that is, is amazing for for weak readers because you have to eventually hopefully then they'll all get here but not everybody is the same in the classroom, right? So if you take a situation like that, and like you said, make it simpler in terms of like, get to the point, another one, and even another one, which was like even more, let's say, reduce, diluted, that you're, you're trying to reach the most of your student. Of course, we're not gonna get everybody. And you have an intention in math that maybe a French or an English teacher doesn't see but you have an intention, you want them to, to perform a specific operation, you want them to, for, to, to check a specific concept, that sometimes this is what you want to check. So a situation like that definitely would not do that role. You know, this is more a, like a synthesized kind of situation with this is at the end where they really like went through a lot of practices, right? But, but, but if it is introduced in like levels, the same situation, Sometimes it will reach uh, the majority of the student at their level. That doesn't mean where we're, how can I say, we're watering down our expectation. We're just adapting the context to there. Our expectation are still the same because in all these group of students, they're still performing the same math skills. It's just we're adapting it to their language level, to their competency. So. I think this is a great idea if, if you have few, you don't have to do a million of them, but have pick two, three, maybe, and do them in levels like that and show the students, hopefully, look, you're here, but eventually I'm going to show you here. And eventually when you get comfortable here, we're going to move you up here. But in terms of math, you're doing the same level as everybody else. We're not reducing our expectation in math. So this is what has to be clear. When we're adapting, we're not modifying content. This is really, really important. It took me a bit of a, of a heart, like a while to understand because sometimes like, oh, but they have a hard time. Yeah, but it doesn't mean if you can't read, it doesn't mean you can't do math. And that's sometimes we have our line cross sometimes. Like I, I talk about myself, like sometimes, oh, I'll make it easier for the student. No, no, that's not what they need. They need just maybe the language adapted, but the content has to stay the same because our expectation, they're going to be evaluated the same everywhere, right? So this is just my... Uh, my struggle with this. I was, I was just going to say working in adult ed in our four month semesters or less, 
we and we can't adapt because we we can't really adapt the questions because all they write is that government exam and that's all they're going to get so for us we really struggle with with the language and the reading because we can't do anything which is the hard part yeah but think, the, sorry just to add something it depends where the students is coming into if they're coming into a sec four hundred percent but if they have there you have a student coming in from sec one you have from sec one to sec three where you could work on all these tools but that's that's for for the students starting from sec one but the students are coming in let's say for sec four maybe that those courses the cst courses like vanessa were saying maybe these are like you know saving grace in a way having that one week and just pumping them with tools and strategies and you know what if they take a bit longer in getting something you know, at that point, it's success that matters at the end of the, the, the road, and success means differently for other people. And obviously, if they're at this point, they're in adult ed because nothing else worked anywhere else. So we have to be sometimes taking a step back can move us three steps forward sometimes. But well, I it, don't. Yeah, don't it's true. Sure. And well, we just recently, because of our sec one and sec two are so low, we've actually restructured that program to take more time. But I was just tasked with actually looking at how many students are in our lower level math and also taking English or French. And we're possibly looking at a center revamp of grouping to be able to work. And it's coming down to literacy skills for a lot of them in that. So that's something we are looking at because of what we're seeing now. Sonia but, has her hand up. But um, I just wanted to sort of uh, address a little bit what Mr. Sanchez was talking about, well, what we're all talking about actually. But um, at, at Riverside, we are having a problem with our level three students. They're, they're not passing and they're just sort of spinning their wheels in level three. And literacy is obviously the biggest issue uh, for, from what our teachers are explaining. So we are starting to write um, local exams. We're sort of, it's a kind of a pilot project. We're writing local exams to, that, has, uh, that makes the problems more succinct. So this problem here, we, we would we would kind of cut out some information from this problem, um, add some images to it. But I what I what is really important here that I want to address is that like it's it's such an art to create a, a math problem. It takes a long time to create the perfect problem. And in this problem that we see on the screen, what makes this complex is those last is like the last paragraph. And so we're trying to make succinct problems that are still complex tasks in the sense that they, they um, require or they, they tap into multiple concepts. So they're still complex. They're just written more succinctly. This problem here again, it's the last paragraph. The salesperson offers them a 10% discount. And then the uh, question that makes this problem complex that pulls in a lot of concepts for the student that, that the student has to use to solve the problem. So it's, again, it's a real art to write these problems, but I think there is a way to make them more succinct. Um, yeah, that's it. It's something that we're, we're testing out at Riverside and hopefully it, it helps our students. Mr. Sanchez has his hand up. Uh, yes, I'm gonna be really uh, For example, this kind of problem with this money or, or the student loan or something like that, Always, I ask my students, always I give them some starting point. For example, we have here, we go from zero to 4,523. And there is some event that's gonna happen in between. And uh, we wanna push this eight weeks into six. So let's, they have to just check what is happening here. So it is doable. So. Uh, there are some specific problems I mentioned uh, with the uh, timeline that can be just uh, at a certain point, maybe like loans, uh, uh, saving, all these kind of things. Very relevant comment. Thank you. Yes, I think all of you are right. And when we presented that task, it was not to say this is a perfect task at all. I just want to make this clear. It was actually to see this is in a regular, you know, adult booklet. What do you think? 
his are there. And we know there's a lot of obstacles for students, just more to say, what do we do with this? The comic book was a, a way to do it. Sonia was really right. The last part, the last paragraph was really problematic. So this could be rewritten and you could have a different version actually with the last portion like rewritten. And it would be the same mathematical notions that would be, you know, ask from the students, but it's just, it's not about being a good reader. It's about being able to do the task in maths and be able to read, yes, but not at this level. So yes. So yeah, thank you. That, uh, that is good for me. Yeah, it's a good uh, comment to put, to, to curious to see if they would put it in a video and then the summary of it on paper, that might be a way to offset that as well. Yes, you're right. That's a good point. So we have another one. Just uh, We had many more in French, but we know this takes a lot of time, like we've experienced it. So we'll just have another one. I'll let you look at it and same thing. Try, try to think at what are the hints about the text structure, the type of text, and then we'll talk about it. Well, I could start if you want, Vanessa. Yes, thank well, you. I, I don't like this table. <laughs> I think I think the students are not used to seeing 80 as a, a common number between two columns. They're so used to seeing column per column. So this is like, what is that? What does that mean? It, it might like just throw them off. So this is another obstacle. Um, I, 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 I may take a look at a problem like that. I say, okay, there's, there's a picture <clears throat> of the situation. There's a legend, so there's measurements, there's a table, there's words, okay? Um, this is obstacle, obstacle, obstacle. So now I have three registers that I have to kind of digest in my head, you know? There's words, there's a table, and there's a picture. So there's lots of things going on. And, and where's the question? It's at the bottom where the location of the question is also like, kind of disconnected with the text so a lot of students may miss that and um, well that's a few of my observations that's good do you have any idea Michigan? you said there's another information about what type of text that might be or someone else it might be a mix or many also <laughs> what type of text yeah so in this case here, there's a lot of information. I will go for an affirmative type of text. That's yeah. my first go-to. There's some descriptions, information, some explanatory content. So we have a mix of uh, all types of informative text. You're, you're correct. And there's different registers that like you said, like you have the image, you have like the, well, the image representation, you have the table, you have the text. So the students really have to be able to manage to go from one to the other and make sense of their whole problem. So that's not easy. So that being said, if anybody doesn't have like any specific, I know we are, I'm kind of late on my timing and I, I wanna leave some time to Michelin to go ahead. So maybe we'll just skip on all of the information. I just had information about the type of text later on on this slide, but we can move on. What I really wanna show you guys on the next slide is that we've seen a link between the type of text and the mathematical you know, concepts that are in play. Let's say narrative text often goes with algebraic modeling. In promotional or explanatory text, everything goes with geometric modeling. Same on this next slide. Like we have like, th these were the tasks we just, we've just seen, but on the next slide, we see more of generally like narrative often goes with algebra, informative often goes with algebra also, but descriptive and informative often go with geometry. So this, knowing this, I, and we're talking about exams and adult book that, knowing this, we can make predictions with the students. We can ask them like, look, we have a story. What do you think we're gonna do today? Of course, they're already in their, <clears throat> their course, but I mean, asking them how to treat a complex task and linking the text types and structures might help them to actually predict what they're gonna be asked to do in the course. So that was just like a, a small observations we had and we found it uh, relevant. So we yeah. can move on to the next one. Just to add on yeah. one uh, what Vanessa was saying, this is, uh, this is uh, Martin and Vanessa had looked through lots of exams, lots of complex tasks. And this is an observation that they noticed that this, the algebraic modeling, always seems to have a narrative, more or less, most of the time, a narrative text. 
and and the geometry always a descriptive so so whoever's teaching maybe a geometry class would like probably bring in more of a descriptive type of text but if you're teaching a like 3051 for example an algebra algebraic modeling type of class algebra throughout these are more kind of texts that you could like kind of create or or you know tackle but again these are observation one of the um, the many well struggles that the students have like and it's not just it's in math it's everywhere is that when they have to do inferences to actually deduct information that is not explicitly written it's implicit we know that they really have a harder time the weakest readers to actually be able to do this like the strong reader won't have any problem they'll make the inferences they, they won't even sometimes they're even unconsciously made they don't even stop at it you know they were going to make it mentally very easily most of us do or we know oh i have something to deduct here like we know as strong readers but the students that are that have more struggles actually don't uh, so if we go to the next task, it's not that hard, but there's some inferences and you're going to see that those small inferences read the, this uh, problem and just ask yourself, what are the inferences they need to do that might block them from being able to solve the problem at all? Uh, would you like me to read it? Yeah, you can go ahead and see. Okay. Ekaterina and Milan are special education teachers. This year, they are working mainly with students who have learning difficulties in their school subjects. Here are the results obtained by their students in French, math, and English. Then you have the results. Ekaterina and Milan believe that students who have difficulties in French also have difficulties in English. They also think that students who have difficulties in mathematics also have difficulties in French. Do the results obtained by students with learning difficulties represent what these two special education teachers think. So a lot of inferences, like, I don't know, I, I would be curious to know what Sonia thinks, because I know she's reread a lot of uh, complex tasks. Like, I don't know if you, Sonia, you're still here, but I'm, I'm curious to know, like, what do you think in terms of inferences? Like, it's very hard, actually, to, <laughs> this, to, to understand this text. Michelle, you want to add something? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to comment that if I was a, a student doing this who knew that I might be struggling with stuff, I would say, like, what the heck? Do you think I can't do this? Because I'm looking at the statistics. Like, my attitude would be like, Phew. yeah, wouldn't even make an effort. I love this. Emotionally, you might already, like, block this task. You might already say what we're talking about, something very sensitive to me, and we're saying, like, I cannot succeed because I have difficulties there and there. Like, what the hell? And this is taken from a, a booklet. Like, we haven't made, obviously, this task. But yes, I, this is a very relevant time. And not even getting to the inferences, you might already block emotionally and say, this is too much for me. I don't want to do this and actually feel not motivated at all to continue like your day at school that day so yes other inferences Michelle, that you see well personally i see you know knowing that this is like almost like a statistics uh, kind of question uh the way we build the table and notice over here it says result obtained by milan student in alphabetical order but yet is the table in alphabetical order you know, I'm not sure, is it with the first name? Is it with the second name? So there is kind of a bit a representation clash, personally, I think, unless that's the intention, but this is what I, this is where my brain goes like matching stuff. <laughs> and, and the other thing also that I found super interesting here, um, uh, when they're talking, uh, does like success also, what does that mean? You know, what do they consider? Like, I agree with you, Michelle, in terms of like context, I think it's a bit insensitive, but also like, what is really, um, what is really here a consider like passing grade? Is it still 60, but it's not mentioned? Is it assumed? Is it, you know? So I think these are things I would like get stuck on because again, I'm more analytical. I know, like I need more like defined variables, <laughs> but that's me. <laughs> And I assume the student might be stuck on those, some. Yeah, you're right. So we can skip the next, or we can look at the next slide very fast. Like the next slide is actually the results. What Michelin said, uh, what is alphabetical order like? And it's not sorted in the table. So they have to do it. So they have to make the inference in math and in reading that, oh, I have to place them in alphabetical order myself. 
the significance of difficulty linked to grade and other elements in the task. There were others, but I love Michelle's comments about like how insensitive this is. Like uh, sometimes we overlook this, you know, we're so concentrated on reading or maths that we overlook that the subject is sensitive. Yeah. So a quick overlook of all the strategies we might encourage our students to do before reading, having an intention. Why am I reading this? I gave you an intention while reading all of the tasks, like concentrate on type structure, concentrate on inferences you have to make. So this, you have the reason why you're reading, you know, it was clear to you. So you might want to make the students more aware of what they're doing, complex tasks in math, specific ones have an overview of the text and make predictions. So sometimes just looking at the image, at the title, at how it's presented, make predictions. It might be in your regard of type of text. If you have a narrative text, probably I'm in algebra, like am I? So these type of things. During the readings, there's a lot happening. So the students has to make connections with previous knowledge, identify and analyze the question or the task that they have to perform check the understanding that they have, make sure they understand all of the words. So like important information, we talked about high, highlighter and it's true, like to select the important information is so important in itself, uh, but very often they don't know what is important. They're just gonna, you know, highlight the whole thing. So make inferences might be another strategies. Identify the sources of difficulty. Like if it's vocabulary, like I know this and I can go into the dictionary and look at for the word. Um, questioning oneself on the text. That was part of the aviary. Like, I, and I, I need to be allowed to question the question, to question the text, to question the meaning, and then make mental imagery, representations of the problem, especially with narrative and scenario. Yes, Michelle? I'm, I'm just thinking, like, I know we should be teaching this all the way along, and I think, you know, definitely, but I wonder, putting up a poster like that in a testing room or in a supervising room, is that, like, legal and able to, and can we suggest it? Go ahead, Michelle. I see you uh, nodding in. <laughs> I will tell you, this is a rule, maybe a hidden rule somewhere, that if it's on the wall, before the student shows up, and during their learning, and even after their learning, it becomes part of the wall. So having a poster like this, it's not telling them answers. It's not telling them anything. It's just there to support if need to. So if a student looks at this, say, check your understanding, and to him, it's a trigger point for him to know what to do, that be it. Because there's nothing here that suggests some anything illegal <laughs> you know so i would definitely encourage stuff like that and i in my classroom i learned that from a class that i took on sanction once in the university that she said everything that is on the wall before the students walks in stays on the wall and it becomes part of the decor if it's intentionally put up during the learning that's a different situation but if it's there before it's fine but, okay, don't quote me on this. Like, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> but this is what I learned. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. I didn't know what to say. So I'm glad you had something to say officially. So after the reading, the synthesis of the summary uh, is very important to make sure that the student has a global understanding of the problem and maybe have different versions of it. Uh, and then finally, confirm the deny in your initial hypothesis and then verify the, the realization of our reading intention. So at the beginning, we had an intention and then we go back to it at the end. Like we go back and say, oh, so is this, do, can I solve this? Which type of text is, is this? What are the inferences? So you just, that's about it. I think I'm almost done. So go ahead, Micheline. Yeah. So just to let you know that last part of Vanessa, what she mentioned about the after, that could be done also during also. So what's really important that I find even in complex tasks that sometimes we start with a question, we get caught up in the math, we never go back and put it in context. So this is a very important thing to, 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 to always bring back to the attention of the student. We have a problem to solve, but you solved it through mathematics, but now at the end, when you give your answer, it has to be related to the initial problem. So this is something really um, should be kind of encouraged to always like, uh, to always encourage the students to always go back and put it in context, always go back and run it. And also like, I never gave my students, uh, well, obviously when I give them assignments or complex tasks, the intention on them obviously is to practice specifically, but now maybe, uh, 
um, intentionally verbalizing it, say, well, this is a complex as I want you to practice this notion. So they know they're connecting the notion to a complex task. So in case later on, kind of, they see something similar, they can have this connection because we know we need to make a lot more. They're having, the, they have difficulty making links to concepts. So by verbalizing it sometimes, it just kind of creates an automatic link, right? So this is for this. Um, uh, and again, just to remind you, sometimes is like, I know this is something we mentioned in part one of, of this math workshop, uh, the previous time is sometimes the legibility of the document is also an obstacle. So having an accessible font like Arial, uh, Century Gothic, uh, Cosmic um, Sans, these are sometimes it might just help our, our students who have the uh, ADD or, or dyslexia to, to just read better the information, right? Um, choosing a, a larger font like 12 to 14 is very helpful. Again, it's clearer. You know, like I said it before, the brain loves pretty things, you know, so if it looks nice and aired and pretty, the brain is invited, it's being charmed to read, right? Um, the next thing is also printing on one side sheet or printing on oversized sheet, you know, where you have the problem there and all the questions, the task on one paper, sometimes it's either, I don't know about you, but some of my students sometimes have difficulty remembering that there's something on the other side of the page and sometimes they miss half of the problem, you know, so, you know, so having on one side, I know it's not environmentally friendly, you know, and digital would be nice, but some people still need that kinesthetic component, right? So to, to just think, uh, to, just to think to, to print things on one side only and give them spacing for them to think. Remember, um, some of us, some of us will, uh, like, uh, they, they need space to think, to draw, to, 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 so making our problems with lots of spacing, that's good. And I love my favorite is to leave the interline, like the spacing between lines of minimum of 1.5. And that is really for second language learners or students who have difficulty with vocabulary mainly so they could draw on top or put their translation in their native language. So having space for that is really useful because sometimes, you know, to understand, you need to know vocabulary, right? So having that visual, visual, how can I say, um, Okay. clean this if you want is it's helpful for student and notice on the side I want to show you the three codes written code mathematical code and oral code they actually interplay simultaneously in math right so how would I know if it's a math code or a written code is I use the oral one <laughs> so if again when we ask a question the same problem we read it out loud to the student or we verbally tell talk to the student and the student is able to understand it and show us how they will be solving it. So it's not a mathematical problem. It's obviously, it's a written problem. So we know that this is the written code is, in, is, in, is at play and we need to find ways to support the students. But if we find orally that it's nor the problem nor the math is an issue, so let's try it by written. So we try different methodology to figure out where really is it falling? At where, where does it fail for the student to understand, to tackle these kind of problems, right? So it's all trial and error. There's no recipe for that, by the way. So uh, Julie, you have something to add? Yeah, just to, 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 to say that for the content also, we don't think about it, but that's a tip Jenny Lamoureux gave me, and it's wonderful. You can ask the student that was struggling with the problem after he has done it, how he would have presented itself. And then you keep the way he told you and you propose it to another student. So for Jenny Lamoureux, for example, some of the, the, the problems she has, she has them like in four or five versions. Every one of those versions are student made. So the only thing she's doing is just to put it back on a computer or something, you know, to, to make it happen. But she followed what the students uh, told her. So that's a, a good way to get other material of other kind. Thank you. Very, very, uh, very, very good idea. I used to do that at the end of my classes, but not at the beginning, but that's smart. That's actually clever. 
So reading strategy to develop. So I think, I believe that if we teach this, the students to distinguish a problem statement from the set of information that mimic uh, a problem statement. So knowing really to make them identify where is the question of the problem. Also uh, identify the context. What is it about? Like make them think, take them and make them take a step back. Okay, you're reading something. What is it about really? Take a moment and think, right? Um, giving them the strategies to, uh, uh, to, to search for the information. You know, okay, what is relevant? What's not relevant? Well, first of all, search for the information and then distinguish which one is useless and which one is useful for me. Also identify what's the missing information. Sometimes the students are, like I used to give them sometimes problems with intentionally missing information to see anybody's gonna notice and tell me miss, uh, this is missing. Sometimes they trust me so much that they'll come up with weird solution. I'm like, but you don't have this. How did you do it? You know, and I'm like this mischievous side of me sometimes just to, to see like, are they really paying attention or are they automatically just trying to like do things, right? So here in this case is to get them like, like uh, Judy said, put them their detective hat and make them look around for, for information that we need, we don't need, that, that is missing, not missing. You know, is, is there an issue with the problem? Not. Um, and also to, to, to help them combine different type of information presented in different media. So again, making links, like if I have a picture, I have a text, does the picture link to the text? Because I know this is also a strategy in languages that they use. Sometimes if they want to understand the problem, they would look at the picture, see, well, does the picture gives me some hint about the context? So we have to really also be on our end, very, very specific in choosing picture that makes sense with the context, because sometimes we have pictures that have nothing to do with the context and will misguide our students. So this is something we have to be careful uh, for. And also the, the switch between a text filling in a table or the other way around, I have to, a table with lots of numbers in it. What do they mean, you know, or a drawing and vice versa. So the changing of registers, right, to be, uh, to, to, to tool them with that. And also to uh, rearrange one or more statement giving in the wrong order. Sometimes, uh, sometimes the problem is written like weirdly, I'm going to use the word weirdly, and it doesn't logically make sense, you know, and maybe like, like uh, Mr. Sanchez said, everybody is unique and their way of processing the information is unique. And sometimes you hear a problem, it doesn't make sense. And you just logically in your mind kind of put it in order, say, no, I understand it. This would break it apart and put it in order in a way that you understand it. So way, uh, so way to consolidate reading strategy is the creation process. The creation process is the ultimate metacognitive uh, competency. So asking them to create a problem, you know it takes a lot to create a problem. So this is one way of, of actually consolidating reading strategy. Um, you, could, you could give them like, uh, for example, one numerical information is given and say, okay, create something. So I'm gonna give you this, create something. Or giving them an idea and say, I want a, I want a, a, a situation about, I don't know, uh, um, I don't know, slopes, create something about slopes. So they're gonna create something. Or you start off a, a problem and say, okay, you build on it, you know? Um, and then also like you may give them uh, an operation and say, okay, I want you to have like, uh, okay, uh, an addition, subtraction, an exponent in a problem. Create a problem with those, let's say, uh, constriction. And, and let's see what they come up with. Sometimes this is how I also generate uh, problems in class because you could create so much too, right? Um, another way of, of looking is associating a statement with, given without a question, okay? So uh, like you give them a situation without a question and you ask them to now, okay, create a question, create multiple questions for this question, right? So they'll have to think about it, like how many ways can I ask something in that specific problem? So that's also kind of develop their inquisition thinking, right? Um, and also develop, also find an intermediate question. You know, when we're talking, students are having an issue um, between linking things. So kind of say, okay, I have a list of this, I have a list of this, and now you're going to create a question that is going to be, it's going to guide me to get to there, or like they're going to link both, or, you know, that's going to make me think of that, you know? 
So these are all skills that you could teach the students that to develop, to help them with linking material. And of course, uh, find problem questions like um, that's the question, uh, like related to a given statement of that question and distinguishing them questions to answers are in the text. Sometimes the questions like very straightforward, the answer is there, but they're not reading it attentively enough to, to, to pinpoint it and uh, or creating a question with less information, right? So um, a short, uh, this is a short guide to good practice. So again, like this is doesn't have to be all done, but this is things that we could have on hand in case, depending on the students that we have. So like saying, imagine the situation and don't forget what you're looking for. So yeah, get in like, like I like one of the stories before with the TV, I had a student who got stuck with this situation about Abdul and, and I think Leah, and they're like, but why would they want to do that? And I'm like, who cares about the context? Sometimes they get stuck in the context and they miss the point of the problem. And sometimes you have to bring them back and say, okay, what's the point of this? They want to buy a TV. That's it. <laughs> you know, forget about them, you know? So also to give them, uh, give them to like to concentrate long enough. So, um, so for example, like I know some of our students that have difficulty concentrating. So creating white noise areas in the classroom where they could kind of like think, you know? Um, Organizing oneself, you know, uh, teach them to manage time, data, keep track of their attempt. Okay, I tried this problem four times, and each time I tried, this is what I did, this is what I, so it's not repeating the same thing over and over, and that calling it a try, that would be one try, even if I tried it 20 times the same thing. So keeping tab of what they tried, sometimes that makes them realize that, oh my God, I'm using the same way the same like and asking for a different answer right so sometimes that's also realization right uh, also uh taking initiative the risk of making mistakes saying like for example if um somebody comes to you and say i don't know what to do say okay let's take a look at what you learn in sec three now you're in four let's see what you'd look in sec three you learn about slope okay now can you solve this problem with slopes let's try it and, and, and let them make mistakes and say, okay, well, you can. So what else can we try? So guide them, but allowing mistakes, because when you make mistakes, you learn, you're going to remember, oh, I tried this. It didn't work last time. So this time I'm going to try this. And you can make your own kind of conclusions, your, your own hypotheses about it, right? Um, use all available material to them make diagram and make drawings, use manipulative if needs to. We're all different learners and let's activate whatever method we learn best. So give them normalizing all kinds of materials for them to use. Um, also to develop an original approach. Tell them like, you know, if you have those students who are a bit ahead of the game, say, okay, well, why don't you challenge them? Say, okay, find me like multiple ways of solving this, right? And okay, if they tell you, well, we learned this shortcut. I love those when they tell me that. Okay, show me your shortcut that works all the time. You have three problems, show me that it always work. You know, so instead of like uh, arguing with them that this shortcut doesn't work in this situation specifically, and I have many of those students that would argue with me like, no, no, this is how it should be. And I don't understand why it's wrong. Well, because it doesn't work. No, 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 this is how it should be. And I say, okay, show me that you get, this is the answer. Show me how you could get the answer with your method. And if you can, for those next four problems, we'll look at it, you know? So also asking them to, to explain what they're done. Again, like I said it before, out loud, like just explain to me. And through the explanation or explain it to a peer, through the explanation, they're thinking, they're thinking out loud, okay, this is step one, step two, step four. It's almost like they're self-programming, you know, and they could kind of almost like evaluate does that make sense or not. Uh, and argue about validity of a solution. Give them wrong or right answers and get them to actually discuss them having mathematic conversations or share their answers and actually justify or stand by it or why or why not. And again, validate one's own result uh, or those of others. Again, you, you found the solution, tell me why, how come, stand by it, show me what you use as a concept, back it up with stuff, you know? So these kind of conversations are really, really useful. Um, again, progressing of activity to consolidate reading strategy also depend on the diagnosis. Some activity can include some developed strategy for reading mathematical to solve problems. So it depends on the student. 
some students are strong, they'll need to slow down. Sometimes, sometimes they need to be challenged more. Sometimes they, they don't realize what they're from. So this is why you, you're, you're almost playing, you're, you're playing, okay, where does it fall? Is it this map? Is it missing this? Is it missing that? How can I help that student? So this is what an overview of all these sections that I'm gonna show you today to consolidate reading strategies. And you'll see for every step in solving a, a complex task, there is actually activities and, and tricks that may help you support them. That, that is a full task from, eight, uh, from section one to seven, it's the full task. And in the full task, um, the way we cut it down is in seven section. And each section, the student may not have a problem in all seven. He may have a problem in section one and section two, and then three, four, five will settle in place. Sometimes the, the students have difficulty in three, four, five. So again, this is an overview of all the complex situation that is actually cut in pieces and um, as a reading strategy been in uh, kind of in support of each of these sections. So let's take a look at section one. Um, section one talks about recognizing a problem statement and starting a glossary of polysomerous words. These are words that have multiple meanings. So the same word could be put in different contexts and will have a different meaning. So these are difficult ones for our students. So let's take a look. So if we have a problem like that, so to identify the problem statement, for example, so let's read this. The cherry tree in my garden was 153 centimeter tall last year. It produced two kilograms of cherries. This year it grew and produced three kilograms of cherries. Now, how tall is my cherry tree? So now my question to you, is this a complete problem? It's incomplete information. Okay, why is it incomplete? I know how tall is my cherry tree. I don't know if it grew or not. I don't have information if it can grow taller. Um, I so, don't know. I don't that, know. No, no, it's perfect. Yeah, That's but I don't know. Know. <laughs> <laughs> it's exactly the conversation we want to have, right? Because you're putting your student hats in all of this, right? So obviously, when we're asking you now, how tall is the cherry? Now, suddenly we pay attention to the question. Okay, so now what do I need to know how tall, right? So what do you do? You go back and look. Okay, what here gives me information about height? Well, is it centimeter? Is it kilogram? So you see all of that is happening at once, right? So if you don't know kilogram is for mass and centimeter is for height, you may get stuck there. You may say, okay, tall, tall, tall. Oh, there's a word tall there. So maybe I match the tall together, right? So, but how tall do I know? How tall is it really? So do I know what is it now? So all of these kind of questioning that's happening in your mind, if we don't take a moment and allow that thinking to happen, you know, uh, thinking to happen, the student won't even recognize that this is an incomplete problem. And yes, you're absolutely right. No, it's missing information because I don't know how tall is the tree now. So I don't know if I have to do a difference, if I have to add. So this is something you could say, okay, you're right. You're absolutely right. It's missing information. Now, what would you add? You know, what would you add to make it a complete problem? Find me ways to add, you know, and this is where they're going to say, okay, well, I have to match this with this. So this is a lot of thinking going on. Make sense? Another, another, another uh, problem I may uh, show you here. Let's try this one. Oops. So take a moment, read it, and you guys tell me. Well, it says my family. Are there family members not mentioned? <laughs> are there brothers and sisters that are not listed there? Other than that, I'm happy with it, but I'm just, how many are in my family? <laughs> well, you see, I love how you kind of now, you know, the first time you, like the first time somebody did it may have like been like, oh God, I didn't pay attention to all these details. But the second time they're like, oh my, now I'm going to pay attention. Now I'm going to start asking questions. You see that trigger the second time around, how you start like validating, like you're becoming a participant, an active participant in solving a problem versus before, oh, it's another one to do. Okay, what do they want? Oh, it has to do addition. Let me just add, you know, now we're like, I love it. You're right. You're absolutely right. I ate the, with my family. So 
one one question. Yes, it is a complete problem. I have everything I need in terms of mathematics, but then I could have challenged just by, well, how many of my my family members? You know, maybe I should have, I would have adjusted it with weight. And this is fun because you're just taking a problem and making another version of it that's even better, right? So this is this is the fun part. So here you're teaching the students to actually identify the question and see if the question match, do I have everything I need, you know, with, with it. So this could be only this at the beginning, just giving them stuff and say, what's missing, you know, is this complete, you know, and, and give them trick. Like sometimes, you know, what, what I do with my students, the weaker, um, the weaker, uh, in language, I say, okay, you don't know how to do it. That's fine. Look, they're asking for money. Okay, how much do we get? They give him back. Okay, so it's talking about money. So where do I see the money symbol? So I start like matching money symbol. Then I go back. Okay, then I reread it again and again, you know? So these are all little tricks we could do with, with our students. So this is, this is something I've done in my class of science. And my science class, sorry, but I never did, never thought of doing in my math class because I thought like, you know, they should know, but I've done it only for like operations, but I didn't realize words like common words used in problem is also an issue, right? To be honest, I'm being very honest with you. So I start making like questions, like uh, every time the deal was with my students is every time we, I give them a problem, they find a word that they didn't know that they would add it up to a list that I have on the wall somewhere in the classroom, right? And that list kept on going and going and going. And I took that list and I start giving it to my next class. Say, look, these are words that could have many meanings in different contexts, right? You keep adding your own word. You could cross out the ones that you already know and remember the ones you don't know. So you build vocabulary. But this is something like almost like could be a shared thing like on a wall somewhere. There could be a, something that they have like a vocabulary notebook on the side. It could be whatever, but they build, it could be an interactive, like a shared, like a, a Google document that everybody has access to, you know, and, and, and that everybody, like, let's say if they get stuck, they could go take a look and say, oh, okay, this is what it means, you know? Or these are words I have to be careful on. Or if you, have, if you know already somebody who have a language issue, you can almost give them like a list of words prior the problem and say, check these words, do your homework, right? So, so these are just ideas to, to, to help you with that. Now, another uh, section two is, is associate a statement with its question. So let's take a look at this. So you could give them, this is the idea, you could give them multiple situation and you have the questions at the bottom, right? And say match, which question match the situation? So here they're kind of have to find tricks to connect the situation with the question. So like, let's take a look at the first one. A soccer stadium can hold 8,000 people for the last game. There were 4,256 spectators. Now let's take a look at the group, like the list of questions. Which one, which of these questions will match that problem? Will the manager still be able to buy a printer worth $700? No, it doesn't make sense because here we're talking about stadiums and here we're talking about printers. So absolutely not. How far did it travel in total? Again, no, we're talking about a stadium, spectators, and here we're talking about something traveling. So something has to be in movement. How gasoline have customer purchased since Monday? Again, notice how, and for example, the, how many empty seats were left? Well, seats, stadium, okay, that makes sense. So I'll put that with that. But having that exercise, identifying the question with the context, it's, showing them links on how from the question I can go retrieve like information. So this is this is a technique that I, I found very useful. Now um, for section three now, example way to explore, right? So we're exploring. So this is where you're pushing your students to kind of create, right? Invent a question, invent a several question, find intermediate questions. So for example, you could give them situations like that and, it, and ask them, okay, give it to a class or give it to a couple of students and say, okay, create a question based on this, this problem, okay? And, and actually get them to compare their question. 
because I promise you will be two different questions. So these are two different problems, right? So by creating questions, it's like they have to take the context and situations in consideration, right? So they're developing and they're seeing how hard sometimes it is to, to, to kind of know what you want them to do and to develop like these questions have intention behind it. And it, was, it wasn't randomly there. There's a purpose. And now you are in position to create them. So if you're in position to create them, you understand your intention. So when you have a question on an exam, is to do the reverse process. What do they want me to do there to get them to question themselves? So the same thing over here, the same kind of question, but in this case, ask them to, to, to create multiple questions and actually solve them for fun and see what kind of answers they get, you know? And say, look, if I ask you, you ask yourself this question, look what you get, you ask yourself this question, look how the answers are completely different. It all depends on how your question is formulated, right? So this is to develop um, to develop this kind of um, awareness, right? Uh, An association to teach them how to associate um, questions to to problems, you know, and the value of the question in a problem. So this one I find is one of the most um, challenging one because um, the students have to kind of connect they have to kind of display their, their work in their head. So it's like almost like you have those students who they read the question, they put you the answer, but they don't show you your work, their work, right? So this kind of, um, let's say tool will force the students by creating a, that middle question is they're, they're kind of forcing, you're forcing them to do that, to show, to demo their middle steps, show their work mentally. So let's take a look at this. So let's take a look at this kind of question. A merchant received three checks, one for uh, 212.25 cents, a second for 488, and a third for 453 and 50 cents. After depositing these, check, uh, these three checks in the bank, her statement shows a net credit uh, balance of 2,388.35. So what kind of middle question you could ask yourself? Let's see, anything that comes to mind that you could kind of ask yourself between the check deposit and her statement, is there something you could kind of throw in in the middle? How much money was did she start with? Absolutely, I love it. That's exactly the idea. How much money did she have in her account before cashing these checks? So this, again, it's a middle, thought so how would I do that I have to add and subtract and but that's a middle thought or it could be another kind of question completely so let's take a look at this three friends go to spend a weekend at the lake uh, Nantua uh, the trip costs 122 dollars uh, for food sorry the food 105 uh, and the camping is 25 dollars they have planned a budget of 275 for this trip if they share the expense equally what will each one share. Again, take a moment. What kind of question would you ask as a middle question here? I don't know. They're missing stuff, it seems. But how much will be left to plan? Uh, how much will be left in the plan budget? So what's will be left, right? So here, 105 for something else. It seems maybe drinks and camping. So the problem kind of, kind of decided to take off on me. So <laughs> this is the idea behind it, is to give them something, but there's always a middle question you should ask yourself to develop that thinking like, okay, there's a, I have to link beginning to end to something, okay? Another, another tool for section four, and this way also is to write the answer to a solved problem, okay? So look at this, I give them a problem and I give them choices of answers. So let's take a look. At the hardware store, Lily and I buy two boxes of nails worth $2.50 each pack. What is the total cost? Straightforward. I have two boxes of nails at $2.50, so therefore the answer is five. B, yay, it's done. Now that's where I say, okay, well, how can I change this problem to make it A, the answer? Tell me, how can I change this problem to make it A, the answer? Include a discount. Excellent. I can have a discount. 
Or now I could challenge you more and say, well, okay, what would I do to get C for an answer? What would I have to add to this problem to get C for an answer? It requires a lot more like planning and thinking, manipulating to get where you want to get, right? So I'm going to say, okay, uh, maybe I will have to add uh, that I needed other things from that store, right? Whatever. Uh, I may ha I give the, 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 I give money and one of the bills that I receive is the biggest bill is $50. Who knows, you know, but you give them that choice to, to okay, to say a, an existing problem. Now, if I want the other answers to be correct, how can I manipulate it to make the other answer correct? So here we go. You used something that they were able to do and find the answer. Now, you understood that you had to add these two, like to do 50 plus 250 to get five. Now, let's start manipulating the problem that I wanted different. So now let's get you manipulating the math in a context. That, and if you're able to create is because you know what you're doing, right? So this is the fun part. Um, another, another way of looking at this is actually giving them the answer. Say, this is what I want as an answer and an answer. Now create a problem with this. Create whatever you want that gives me an answer that says the train will be delayed by 22 minutes. Again, remember, these are strategy, not for everybody, for different people at different times, right? But this is a strategy where you can give your students, okay, this is what I want in this. Create a problem with this. That's it. Again, these are all ideas and all tools to put in your toolbox when you need them, you can pull them out. Okay, this is one of my favorite. Uh, reconstitute a disorder statement. And, and this is organization of thoughts. You get a problem sometimes and it's all over the place. And then you say, okay, order it, structure it in such that the events are in logical order. And sometimes it's very difficult for the student to say, oh, I don't know, he went there first, he did that second. So here at 8.30 a.m. and walks. So this is, to them, makes sense. Where is he walking to the, or she walking to the office? For how long? For 15 minutes. What time does she arrive? So I have everything I need. You know, Mrs. Sim, leave her home. So by putting it in this order, you're organizing your thought to be able to solve. Once this is done, the planning is done, this is the hardest part that gets, that needs to be done in the mind because the math, it's straightforward. And this is most of the time the, the thing, they're very, very good in, in application of math because that's what we train. Add, 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 subtract, 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 uh, uh, exponent, uh, whatever it is. But now how do I take the words and use the math? And sometimes in these complex tasks, the math is not difficult. It's getting them from word format to math format. That's it. So this is one, one strategy. Another one, if you want to up up, sorry, if you want to up up, let's say the difficulty, you give them three scenarios and all their statement mixed up and now say, okay, which one goes with which, but have to put them in order. So here they have to figure out um, the words that match with the scenario and then order it. So you're lifting up, you're increasing the difficulties here progressively. Now, if we take a look also like a problem with missing data, complete missing statement, distinguish between useless and unuseless data. These are trick that you could help them with. Again, uh, we read the problem. When Sophie takes the 10.15 a.m. train to Paris and she has 50 euro in her wallet, she eats her meal in the, rest, uh, in the restaurant car and on arrival, she has only 15 euro left. What times does she arrives in Paris? Again, what is, what, is the, what is the question? What am I looking for? What is missing? What am I missing? The question is asking me for what? The total expense, the arrival time, or the travel time? So notice over here, I left euro here. Initially, I wanted to change it to dollars, but I left euro here as an added also obstacle intentionally. And if people might say, well, how come? I had a student say, well, how come? What is this sign? I said, this is euro, you know? And then they were so like, well, why are you using euro? We don't use euro here. I said, no, but look where she is. She's in Paris. 
So to connect, but sometimes they need that conversation too. Because if, if we make everything so, if we protect them always with things they know, we won't push their boundaries too, right? But again, all depends on the students that we have. So something like that. Now, this is also could be even a, a step more for differentiation is actually give them like spacing and say, fill in the blanks, you know? So a concert hall, we can accommodate 500 people currently, X amount of rows of 25 each are fully occupied and there are also X single spectator. You know, each spectator has to pay whatever X amount of dollars for his or her seat. What is the revenue of the day? So here they could design anything they want and we could take this as a template and change numbers throughout and see how this could be given to a class and each one will put their own numbers and find their own answer and they could discuss, you know, how they went about it, right? So these are all tools um, that you could show. Uh, another one here, when we uh, another tool that I found useful is between uh, to, to show the students you may have a lot, a lot of information and how do you actually distinguish between useful and useless data? So I take my problem and I put all the numbers on the side, right? And now I tell them, uh, well, read the question and which out of these numbers I need to be able to solve. Do I need to know how many masons? Do I need to, what is this $19 for? You know, then they'll have to go back and be a bit more critical on selecting what numbers they need, right? Um, notice over here, the same thing. We were giving them lots of information, but at this point uh, we could give them also the solutions and ask them to place them in order. You know, This is the process of solving this. Place them in order. So at this point, these are all, all tools that I will give you to, to, to use at your disposition whenever needed. But I, I would really, uh, I think as a teacher, this is a lot of information <laughs> personally that sometimes I just need to take and dabble with and see where can I use this to, right? Because this is, could be a lot of information that may not may not be relevant to my situation, right? So uh, th all these tools will be uh, available to you with the presentation. And if you have any question on, on, on specific other uh, reading uh, situation that you need help in, that is specific to a student, please reach me and contact me. Me and Vanessa and Giovanna will be more than happy to, to come back uh, for other tools for you, okay? So now I'm gonna pass it oh. back to you. <laughs> So we're going to look at a couple of tools that might support you and not to take away, Mr. Sanchez made a very, very important point before where the math is important. So how do we manage uh, take, you know, addressing these issues, but at the same time, keeping the math as the forefront. So you're not just work looking at the language issues. So there are tools that can support that initiative. But first of all, you're going to experience the tool for yourself. So I'm going to invite you to take about 10 minutes to form. It shouldn't take you more than that. Uh, and it's, it's very brief. We're not going to dwell on it, but just to like experience a couple of tasks. I want to interrupt you. So I have four people that have completed so far. It was the intention was not to saturate you. The intention is just to model a tool. Now, how do we help the students work through this vocabulary work through this this you know these these words that they have to work through well there's a cool little tool called quizlet now what quizlet is again all of the instructions on how to access quizlet what quizlet is is right here all right and i wrote an article for for the chalk shakes that's what i call them they keep shock so it explains what quizlet is how to use it and the class applications. So let's say you have never used Quizlet. You don't know what it is. The first time you access it, you can, you can sign in with your Google account, Facebook, or with your email. You go in, you create an account. You can either begin to create a class set, or 
if you don't have a class set, you simply can search other people's class set. So let's say I want to hear, I want to look for vocab, uh, math vocabulary. Oh my God, math vocabulary. What does it give me for math vocabulary? It generates a, 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 you know, a bunch of um, possibilities. I have this math vocabulary with 66 terms, one with 91 and one with 37 terms. I have the possibility of previewing the terms to see, oh, does it work for me? Is this what I want? And then I can choose to study. For this demonstration, I wanna go with this 91 set one because I feel like it's more comprehensive because I actually did the homework before. So I know that this one is more comprehensive. So I'm gonna choose to study this class set. So your learners, you can take the information, the, the how-to that's in the presentation, take that how-to and how, like point your students towards it. You can have your, make your students create their own class sets. But let's say you don't want to do that. You wanna make your own class set. What you can do is from this class set, you have, you have your terms. You can either do it in class live. You can have flashcards, which is what we're looking at now. So the flashcards, we move on here. Flashcards. We can play a game, we can shuffle them. We click the cards and we move on. So there are many ways that the students can practice um, studying this vocabulary set. So they can have use the flashcards, they could do learn, which is the, make it in smaller groups. In other words, this, this tool breaks up the ways that the student practices the vocabulary. So it isn't like necessarily looking at a list of vocabulary words and repeating them. They are gamified so that the, 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 the words come back in several ways, in different ways, so that, like we said before, learners learn in different ways, right? So presenting the, um, the information in different ways makes it memorable. And the student has the option of, you know, doing the, the, the exercises or the, 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 the methods that they prefer. So for example, they can write them. It's, if you wish, you know, if you want them to learn how to actually write it, if the response, their, the writing needs support, um, they can spell it out loud. But I mean, that's probably more for like uh, children. Sorry, I'm going like faster. Maybe for children, like the spelling might work. Uh, if, if, if a student has a problem spelling, that might be an option, but the option is there for you. Uh, they can test themselves. So once they feel confident, they can test themselves on what they know. They go on, they can do, and, and what it's gonna tell you is if you don't complete the test, it, um, if you don't complete the test, it, it gives you like a, a summary that you need to go back. You haven't completed the test. Would you like to try again? And then you have like gamifying type of stuff. So they match the, um, here, I'm going to start the game. It's like a little bit of a game. So they would have to match. I don't even, I don't even know where to begin. They have like a timer on the side. They would have to match, let's say tape diagram. I got to match it to, I don't even know where I'm. I wouldn't even begin to do it. I'm just, but you understand it's a, they have a gamified version. I'm going to go back and there's another game that they have. So in other words, they have a lot of possibilities to experience the tool, ex, uh, play with the words, revisit the, the vocabulary that they're having difficulty with. And uh, it's also for like, the, the representation, like the, the equation with the word so that they identify what, how the equation is as well, that can also help them. Now, what the teacher can do is you can add this to your existing set. So you can add somebody else's set to your set. You can also customize it. So you like this set, you're happy with it, but there's certain things that you wanna change, you wanna add, you wanna delete, you have the possibility of doing that as well. You can also share it 
with your students. So let's say you don't, you're not going to, you don't go want to go through the burden of like, oh, I'm going to teach them how to go and make a Quizlet. You're just going to send it to them. You're going to, you're going to take charge and you're going to here, study this. Or you can also embed it. Where is it? Here. That's it. This is what I wanted to say. You can print them. That's a lot of paper though. But you can export them or embed them into a site, into another learning manual that you might have. So you have a lot of versatility with this tool that it does not require you to do a lot of, let's say, the, the heavy lifting. And like I said, combining lens, combining the immersive reader with uh, the, the forms and Quizlet, we're starting, we're starting to have a significant toolkit to you know, help the learners um, build that uh, build that vocabulary, uh, support with their literacy issues. If you're struggling with implementing any of these tools and you require support, please, please, please reach out. This is what I'm here for. This is I'm here for that reason. Uh, but I'm curious to know, like, if any have any of you tried the previous tools? Like, no, oh, we, we're getting some no's and you, there's no shame, I understand. But I would like to have some feedback on if you tried them and how they helped or not, you know? Yeah, no, we have Sonia first. Uh, she has a comment. Yes, Sonia. Sonia the inspiration for the Microsoft Forms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it, it, was, uh, it was a great project actually, Joanne. Uh, the teachers uh, are getting into the habit of using forms a little more at our school, but also you were introducing us to H5P and that's another uh, popular one with uh, our teachers as well. So yeah, I would say those two are the main ones for math. And, and we also use Moodle, so it's, they, they're easily embedded into Moodle. So those are the main two, yeah. Quizlet, my daughter has been using that. She's in grade 11 now, but she, I'd say she's been using it since grade eight. And she just, I guess one of her teachers must have shown her how to use it. It wasn't me, unfortunately, <laughs> but uh, she's been using it as a study tool for the longest time. And she makes her own quizzes uh, for various subjects. And I think even she shares them with her classmates. So but she's writing quizzes really for her classmates. Even she should charge them, I think. <laughs> but that's the thing, right? I mean, I, 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 I do this. This is what I used to do. This is what, you know, yeah. this is yeah. what helps yeah. me study. Yeah. Uh, and that's exactly, what the, that's exactly what Quizlet is. It's just a digitized flashcard. But then it, because, because it's digital, it allows for multiple manipulation of the same content. And so the, it, it's, you know, it's presented to the students in different ways, mm -hmm. at different intervals, yeah. uh, you know, but the gamifying part. So it really, it, it makes like your, your, you know, the brain starts to fire up and it makes it memorable. So, yeah. yeah. So thank you. They're all great tools. Thanks. Yeah. I would like to add something to what Giovanna said, just uh, one minute. I love form and I tell you why. Form is super interesting to use for traces, for traces. If let's say you have a student who you, you have difficulties, you need to sometimes have like uh, a trace of their work. So it compiles everything for you. So let's say, I'm not saying to use it on a daily basis, but once a week, maybe just to see where they're at, you know, it's a proof of their work. So it, it becomes super interesting when it's compiled and you don't have to do nothing. It, it gets sent to your account, to your Google account. I used to use it often once a week in my class. Yeah. And the other thing, you know what we were talking about before uh, about like the, when the, oh my gosh, when the problem is very complicated and you want this, you ask the student, like make your own, like make this problem in a different way, like rewrite this problem well. If you become comfortable enough to incorporate a tools like forms in your classroom, you can have your students generate one question, you know, generate this, this form to their students. So they're rewriting that task for each other. Now, what, what, that, what that gives you is it gives you more content. So you use the previous cohort to inform the next cohort, but it, it also, makes puts them in the driver's seat so they start thinking strategically about what it is that they're then going to be uh put 
in, in you know, put in, what's going to be put in front of them. Yeah. So I'm going to be jazzed about the technology just because it allows us to go further. It's just, but uh, it's, it's, these are ways that we can put some of that responsibility agency onto the learner. So we use these tools to help them you know, deconstruct it. So it's not all the teacher that has to be like, okay, now there's more practice here, more, we'll just do it in different ways. And yeah. it, these tools are to help us. And, Michelle, and Michelle. Yes, um, first of all, I have a, a question and then two comments. So my first question is, has any school board or has uh, Kip Shock worked on the CST courses for maybe a, a book for reading strategies that is already available or that I can adapt or modify or because uh, it's just I know that's a big question but I'm just wondering because I took a lot of your good ideas and a long time ago I attended a course on a, uh, learn how to learn uh, I don't know if anybody's familiar with that but that's got a lot of great tools it's just that to try I want to put it in that session so I do have some stuff but I said if it's already made or I can borrow maybe that would be great or share and I do want to say again, thank you so much to the presenters and uh, just your patience and your kindness with us and the information you're sharing. It definitely is helping. I won't be able to consume all of it, but now I'm sharing it with the directors. They're wondering um, what I'm talking about sometimes because uh, our pedagogical counselor is not in with you guys and me. So I think I'll be educating that side a bit because that it, I would assume they're doing it already a little bit, but I don't think so, especially with the idea of changing the exams with the fonts and all that stuff. So that's my next challenge for the new year coming up to, you know, put that into place. So again, thank you for your time and everything that you guys are doing for us. It's really making me feel so much less isolated. So I appreciate that. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. We really appreciate you. For the CST <laughs> courses, I was going to say we're working on the pedagogical sequence, but it's not done. It's probably going to be only finished next year. Like with, we're going to present part of it at the TREAC in June. So part of it's going to be developed, but the reading strategies, they're not the first thing we address because it's for the first courses. And we actually started backwards. We started with the evaluation, like wanted to do the process backwards, the last course, and then we're going up to this. I have to say that how centers, and we also work with the carceral centers, have addressed this it was mainly of like how do we learn as a students more than specific strategies if i'm honest we want to be like more like what material and strategies can we teach the students so we're we're taking a different approach so i haven't seen it but if you have like honestly material for reading strategies that you want to share with us like would be very willing to take it adapt it and integrate it to the sequency and then share it to the rest of the people like I, i'd be glad to see what you've done honestly so thanks michelle for your comments and uh, but i haven't seen anything like this specifically i'm not gonna lie yeah but, but this could be this could be also a very good project if we want to take a look at reading strategy in math so putting like putting uh like compiling definitely. stuff together i think this is something we could like definitely co-host yeah definitely so maybe i'll reach out to you and we'll, we'll get in touch with Vanessa and see how we could make it work i love that thank you thank you Vinny? Um, thank you very much. I have so much information that I need to take back to the math department. I'm not sure if they'll be as open as to some of the change that I think that we should do. But we, our readaptation officer, um, they are going to look at doing a project this summer of rewriting some of our exams where we talked about font and spacing and things like that. And so I know this is being recorded, but I just, is it up? like for a while is it up for a short time because i want her to be able to okay where would i send her to find this recording um yeah. it's so, it's on the yeah go on ahead the cool website it's going to okay. be there under yeah under the math uh under math uh, angle math and uh Perfect. it's going to be it's, it's there right Richard, until perpetuity it's there yeah. okay great thank you <laughs> and, and and just to add up With also the resources the everything and is yeah. fantastic about that yeah and we'll be also i don't know if you know the age resources website the I've age heard resources. about it i haven't been on it okay so in the age resources website there is a section on on workshop it'll be also put in there and there's also another site which is the formation nationale mathématique because that was mandated by the ministry where you're gonna you can have access to the French ones and to the English ones. Excellent. Hopefully next year next year we'll have 
a lot more in the English coming up. This year, we tried to start off with two. Next year, we're going to probably add up the writing also uh, and also science. So reading strategy in, in science and also uh, writing strategies in mathematics. So because our exams, again, they're, they're, they're changing to more like explain and justify. So there's some template, there's some stuff that are actually put together. So we will be definitely building those also, um, those kind of workshops for next year's and we'll probably have some teachers involved also. So if your center is planning to do a project like that, uh, maybe we could keep in touch and have uh, and see how we could help you also. Okay, because yes, I know we have one teacher who has been released to rewrite our math one too. Um, so I know she's working on that now. So this is, I'm like, oh, that's the level that we really need to look at that. Yeah. So, so this, if you ever need any help on that, so please reach out that we, we could probably validate or give her pointers or if, if we could get her a couple of other math teachers to kind of give her feedback, we could, we could put things together to support the teacher or it could be okay. just uh, us ourselves. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. My ple our pleasure. Thank you. There is a math project going on right now for CC the CCBE, by the way, for SEC 1, SEC 2, and pre-SEC, where we'll be kind of, we will be publishing a lot of content on filling up the gaps. Because uh, obviously we can't publish exams, but we, we will be publishing lots of content for from pre-sec. Well, actually, let's start. We were starting off with sec one and two. So that'll be also available on the age resources website. It's not there yet. Jessica is one of the team, <laughs> one of the te a team members. She's a teacher working on it. And she is like God sent. So this is maybe something your teacher could also, if she wants to join also, I have a couple of teachers uh, that they're working super hard on, on they're doing it for their class. That's okay. Uh, for their class and for, for, for others. So it'll be published also. So just to keep in mind that there'll be content coming up your way too. So we, we don't want to like, we, we're trying to, to put lots of content out there to help everybody. So we don't want to kind of double the work. And I know CCBE is the area that most needed everybody's focusing on the second cycle but really the problem comes from the first cycle and by helping the first cycle you're helping the second cycle so we, we it's coming it's just it's just a matter of time and because it's teachers teaching and doing this it's just taking a bit of time you know we don't want to overload the teachers we're super happy that they're helping but um you know just a matter of time also so that's that's the news uh up to today well Thank you so much, everybody. I'd like to thank so much my co-host, uh, Vanessa, Julie, that she left, and of course, Joanna, uh, and Richard, of course. Uh, this is definitely would not happen without all of them. And uh, for sure, please, if anybody you know, anybody of your teachers, or even you as a teacher would like to kind of participate in like, like participate, help us do these kind of workshops, we are open. This is an important, thing to have a teacher with us because then it makes it more concrete so you know what I mean I mean I just left the classroom a year ago so it's still fresh in my mind but you know when time passes by sometimes there's a reality that happens in different centers that doesn't happen in others we would like to capture as much as possible and uh, and reach as much as possible so uh, just keep that in mind if you have somebody who would be interested whatever small or big project that you have that you want to share so maybe you can inspire others this is, this is the place. Thank you so much and have a great afternoon.